In New York right now, a fiercely contested special election is underway. Voters have been braving a snowstorm to cast ballots in the race to replace ousted Republican Congressman George Santos. The outcome will determine if Republicans shrink or expand their razor-thin majority in the U.S. House of Representatives and could send a message about both parties' prospects in the November battles for Congress and the White House. I'm Anderson Cooper in New York with CNN Special Election Coverage. And I'm Jake Tapper in Washington. We are counting down to the first results in this high-stakes contest with urgent implications for American politics in 2024. The vote to fill the seat previously held by Congressman Santos comes after many months of scandal and a litany of lies that led to his indictment on 23 criminal charges, followed by his historic expulsion from Congress in December. Tonight's heated race pits veteran Democrat and former Congressman Tom Suozzi against a relative newcomer to politics, Republican Nassau County legislator Mozzie Pillip. This is a potential nail-biter of a race that's about much more than just who represents New York's 3rd Congressional District in the Long Island area, once once reliably Democratic turf that is now a political battleground. This race tonight could provide important clues for the Biden and Trump campaigns as they gear up for an expected rematch that may be decided by moderate suburban voters such as those who dominate the 3rd Congressional District. And it will have a direct impact on the balance of power in Congress. Republicans are eager to add to their current seven-seat advantage in the House. Democrats hoping to make the GOP's slim majority even slimmer. As the special election unfolds, members of the U.S. House of Representatives just got a fresh reminder about how much every vote counts. Republicans successfully impeached Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas just minutes ago after a similar vote last week narrowly failed and an embarrassing public defeat for GOP leaders. CNN's Manu Raja joins us now from Capitol Hill. Manu, big night, big night for Republicans. Yeah, by the slimmest of margins just now, Jake, 214 to 213, making Alejandro Mayorkas just the second cabinet secretary in American history to be impeached. Republicans moving this after that embarrassing defeat last week, then said this is going to go over to the Senate, despite three Republicans just now voting against it. Expect the Senate potentially by a bipartisan majority in the Senate to quickly dismiss this. But, Jake, this margin underscores the significance of this race tonight. One vote would have made a difference here. If the Democrat Tom Suozzi were in this seat, that would have been enough to scuttle this effort. Mozzie Pillup, the Republican, told me just recently that she would have voted yes. That would have given them cushion on this vote. And that is why this moment is important. About There are huge issues that are pending before the House. These two members, how if they come into Congress, that will in fact impact how the Republican leadership deals with it. Everyone watching this race so intently tonight, Jay. All right, Manu Raju, thanks so much. Now let's get an update on voting in that special congressional election in New York. CNN's John Berman is at a voting site in Carl Place, New York, on Long Island. John, uh, show us around and, and tell us about turnout today. Yeah, welcome to Carl Place High School, home of the frogs, as we like to say here. And right now, over the last few minutes, we did have a few voters show up which actually, I have to say, uh, is a little bit unusual because we get about 20 minutes with no voters here. You can see uh, there are 14 voting booths here, 14 voting booths as of now, one. One is occupied. And turnout could be part of the big story here, Jake, because as of now, 80,000 people have voted on Election Day in New York 3, 80,000 80,000 people voted early. So it's even between the early vote and the election day vote. Why does that matter? Because in the early vote, it broke down. 46% of the early vote was registered Democrat, 32% registered Republican. So the Democrats theoretically have an edge in the early vote, in the mail-in vote. The election day vote, you would think that the Republicans would have to make up a big margin there. As I said, it was dead quiet here in the morning during the snowstorm. It picked up in the afternoon. After you vote in those booths I just showed you, you bring your ballot over to this machine over here. I'm not allowed to show you the screen, but I can read off of it. 262 people have voted in this machine, and there are seven of them here. As I said, it's been fairly light. 80,000 total in the 3rd District voting today. By comparison, in 2022, 192,000 people voted on Election Day. So that is a much, much lower turnout. I'm walking outside here. First of all, you can see some of the snow in the background. And 
a voter. Hi. Sir, uh, what's your name? Donald. Donald, thanks for uh, talking to us. Thanks for coming out. You just voted here in the special election. Yeah. What were the major issues that brought you here? Immigration. Immigration? Uh, and who did you vote for? Mozzie. Mozzie. She was the one you thought could do best on immigration. Yep. All right. Yep. Thanks for talking to us. Thanks for being here. Uh, I do want to note, and it is interesting, we've talked to a number of voters today, almost universally, they said the border and immigration is the number one issue. But it doesn't break purely for the Republicans. Many, if not most of the voters we've spoken to here say that they prefer the Democrat Tom Suozzi on the issue of the border and immigration. He's run all his ads on that, so we are perhaps seeing some persuasion here, Jake. All right, John Berman in Carl Place, New York. Thanks so much. Let's go over to uh, John King. Uh, at the Magic Wall to talk us about New York's third congressional district. So it's in Long Island and part of Queens? It's in Long Island and part of Queens. I left it out broadly just so you see exactly where it is. You see New York City here, then you see Long Island comes out and goes. This is the district, the light gray area. Uh, why is it significant? First and foremost, because of the math over your shoulder. Number one, you just saw that you mentioned the House Republicans impeaching the Homeland Security Secretary. Very narrow majority right now, 219 to 212. There's a few vacancies. This is one of the vacancies that will be filled. New York's third congressional district. George Santos is gone because of, he disgraced himself yep. and disgraced the country. He's gone. So what are you looking for? Uh, you know, there, is there a national message out of New York tonight? Is this just a one-off race? We'll learn as the votes come in. But this is an interesting district for a number of reasons. Let's just take a look as we come through here and bring it out. Number one, this is a district, if you look at the last 10 years of American political political life, the Democrats should win. George Santos was a Republican. Why should Democrats win? Democrats have been doing very well among those higher educated voters. This district won at about one and a half times the national average in terms of voters that have a college degree, at least a bachelor's degree or higher. So it is more educated. That is one reason in recent political times you would say it should tilt Democratic. Another reason, this is a very affluent congressional district. If you look here, uh, 200,000. Two, a little less than 200,000, 22%, above 200,000 income, nearly 30%. Again, more than one and a half times the national average, the median income in this district. So it is more educated and it is more affluent, which means if you look, New York suburbs here, but the Philadelphia suburbs, uh, the Cleveland suburbs, the Atlanta suburbs, the Phoenix suburbs, the people who made Joe Biden president are the people who live in districts like this in New York. Uh, so that's one reason to look at it. Another reason to look at it when you think about it as we go on through November, let me stretch this out a little bit. Really interesting demographics in this district. Not a huge black vote in this district, a traditional piece of the Democratic base. So Tom Suozzi has to get, number one, nearly six in ten voters in the district are white. I talked to him about the, a couple weeks ago when he was in here. He pointed to this, the Asian population, Asian voters. It's nearly 23 percent of the population in the district. It is a giant swing constituency. And he said it was trending back toward the Republicans, and he needed to pull it back. Also, we've seen in the 2020 presidential election, Latinos starting slowly, not hugely, but enough to make a difference trending back toward Republicans, more than 13 percent of the electorate in this district. So uh, it's the suburbs. Uh, you have two great swing groups, Latinos and Asians, to keep an eye on. And let's see. Let's see if it sends a message. Number one, tells Mike Johnson how big his majority is. And number two, we'll see if there are some November lessons. Exciting stuff. Dana Bash, uh, over to you. Well, Jake, these are two candidates who have very, very different backgrounds. In fact, the notion of the two of them wanting to be the representative from this district is about all they have in common. Tom Swazi. The veteran politician. My name is Tom Swazi, and I'm running for the United States Congress. Versus the newcomer. The high-dollar, high-stakes Long Island special election in New York's 3rd District. For me, it's Mozzie versus Swazi, and I'm hoping people will vote for Swazi, not Mozzie. Their names may rhyme, but that's about all Republican Mozzie Pillip and Democrat Tom Swazi have in common. I plan to vote for you. You plan to? Oh, don't watch the debate then, because I don't want to <laughs> lose your vote. Whomever wins this seat, vacant since Republican George Santos was expelled, will have a big impact on a House with a narrow GOP majority. Swazi is a seasoned politician with deep roots in the district. He held the congressional seat for three terms, but left in 2022 in what ended up a failed bid for New York governor. Why do you want to go back to Congress? You know, our country's in a lot of trouble, and I feel like I have got a unique set of skills that can help during this difficult time. Congratulations, you are now a county legislator. His opponent hadn't held any office until three years ago. You were born in Ethiopia, moved to Israel when you were 12, and then came here. Yeah, that's the beautiful things about my journey. 
Even though I was born in Ethiopia, in a small village, at the age of 12, I immigrated to Israel. I finished school there. I joined the IDF. I came to this country about 17 years ago. Um, my husband also immigrated from Ukraine to this country. The mother of seven, an Orthodox Jew, is not your average Nassau County Republican, and that's the point. I was just looking at a, a picture up there of a bunch of, of white men who are more typical of this area. What makes you think that in divided government, you'll be able to do what you say you want to do? I will. I will because it's all about common sense government. I'm very good at working with people, collaborating with people, communicating. For me, it's not about Republican, Democrat. For me, it's about all, about the people, about our country. For many voters, the top issue here is immigration. Biden has to do something about the border. And the border is a big, big issue. Uh, to me right now, it has to be the border and everything that's been going on with that. Most of the $21 million spent on ads about the border. Biden's open border leads to violence right here. You've been hearing a lot of nonsense, blaming Tom Swazi for the migrant problem. It was the most explosive issue in their only debate. When you are in the majority in Congress, you voted to open the borders, you create the migrant crisis, and yes, you kicked ICE from here. When people said, let's abolish ICE, I was only one of 18 Democrats. I went against my party. Hey, everybody. That's Swazi's strategy. Sound as tough as any Republican. We're nowhere near the southern border here in New York. Almost every single person I've talked to, they've said the border is their number one issue. Well, it's right here in our backyard. I mean, there are a lot of migrants that have come up uh, from Texas, uh, and it's affecting people's lives here. And the Republicans have very effectively weaponized it as an issue, as they did with crime a few years ago here in New York. Look at the borders. Pillip came out against the bipartisan immigration bill that died in the Senate last week. It wasn't answering the issue of the border crisis. And not because we don't What's want the solution them. then? The solution is we need to come up with a plan in place how we're going to bring people legally to our country. The way I came to this country, the way my husband came to this country. Before Santos turned it red, Biden comfortably won this suburban part of Long Island. Democrats see it as a key indicator for this November, and they want it back. Joe Biden won what is now this district by eight percentage points. Why is this close? People are just upset that they're not seeing anything get done to address the things that affect their lives. And what about the Santos effect? I think people are fed up with the whole George Santos thing. It's over. It's yesterday's news. But for the fact that my opponent has not been transparent at all. Are you saying she's not transparent a la George Santos? Exactly the same. It's, it's Santos 2.0. She's... I, I would have not said this, but That's for her... a pretty her, big charge. She's been indicted. Yeah, but we don't know anything about her. He's a liar. Bruce Blakeman is executive of Nassau County, where the GOP machine is feverishly working to keep Swazi from turning the seat blue. He walked away from the job, and now he wants to come back and represent people, so why give him a second chance? But at the polls, voters we talked to were split. I think a guy like Tom Swazi has had a lot of opportunity to make an impact here in the local community already in Long Island. So better to have some a new face, a new, new blood? I would think so. I would think so. We voted for Swazi. How come? Because he's normal. We yes. need some normalcy in our mm -hmm. country. Now, when Tom Swazi says it's about Swazi versus Mazi, he's not just making a pun. He's making a really important point that he wants voters to see him for the longtime local politician that he is, not like Joe Biden, who he admits is underwater in his district, not like the squad. He mentioned he went out of his way to tell me that he's concerned about the leftward drift of his party. And Anderson, Mazi Pillip, she also tried to run her own race. She didn't even admit to voting for President Trump until a few days ago. Anderson. All right, Dana, thanks. Uh, back with the, uh, the team here in, in New York. Scott Janice, what, what to you, what is the importance of this race, just kind of big picture? Well, number one, uh, but you see the party spending so much money on this. They're trying to buy some narrative momentum, right? You know, if Republicans can win, it shows a little bit of momentum. If Democrats can take a seat back, it kind of staunches some of the bleeding that they've been doing in the national uh, media cycle lately. So that's number one. Number two, testing out this immigration issue. It's obviously the top issue in the race. Uh, and the Republicans really do believe uh, that it is going to be useful in all kinds of districts across the country that are nowhere near the southern border. So this is the first test case for that. Now, they have been outspent uh, about two to one. Uh, and I think the Republicans are targeting about 24 districts this year that are less Democratic than this one. So even if they don't win, if they get close here or win using immigration as an issue, 
I think you're going to see this uh, become, a, obviously, a key strategy in all these other targeted races throughout the rest of the year. Kathleen, just in terms of, of the race, how do you see it going? Well, so I, this is, obviously, we have to keep in mind that this is a special election. So um, I think that they have been trending more Democratic since 2023 um, or, and last year the, with Pat Ryan, who won a special election. But um, I think if you look at the registration, it should be Tom Swasey. If you look at the turnout, at least early voting, it should be Tom Swasey. But I think Dem it's Democrats be traditionally in this district vote early uh, and Republicans vote yes. uh, on the day of the election. The, there was a snowstorm this morning. Right. Yeah. Turnout a little low uh, this morning. Question is, will it So that set it back a little bit, but the numbers are still very, very close. And I think, that, you know, what, as Scott was talking about, what the issues are, you know, Two years ago, it was public safety. Now it's the migrant issue. And these have been very good issues for Republicans to run on. But if you look at since 2020, you know, when Democrats say, oh, this was a Biden plus this or Biden plus that. Since 2021, at least on Long Island, the trend has not been mm. Biden. It has not been Democrats. There has not been a Democratic win on Long Island which, since 2020. Which is why... Uh, if we beat, if I'm a Democrat, if we beat them today, it begins to punch back on this idea that immigration is going to be a big killer issue for yes, the Republicans. Definitely. It's important because, you know. But immigration does seem to be the biggest it, issue. Yeah, 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 and if we win, it shows that it, it's not going to be this walkaway issue that, that Republicans think. They've generated this whole thing. They put a bunch of uh, migrants on buses and sent them up here to scramble up politics in blue states and blue cities to make it tough for us, to make immigration a real issue for us. If it turns out, that somebody who's a Democrat, but who's strong and smart in immigration, can beat back a Republican tonight, it shows this issue is not going to go the way they think it's going to go nationally. Can, if I can just yeah. add, I, I would say that I think Tom Swasey has done a really good job talking to the voters and how they feel. Mm -hmm. He is not talking about a national message. He's talking about being a common sense Democrat who knows how to get the job done, who knows how to fix the problem. He is acknowledging how voters are feeling. And I think that is refreshing, at least on Long Island, to hear a Democrat. You know, Mozzie is, I mean, ha, is more well known uh, in the area. It's got a, a longer track record. Uh, uh, excuse me, Swazi uh, is more well known than, than, than Mozzie is certainly, but she does have the, the, the Republican machine but behind her. Yeah, uh, if I were to use like a football or Super Bowl analogy, Swazi would be the San Francisco 49ers coming in. He's known, he's won in, uh, in that area. Uh, as was mentioned before, the President Biden had won the district by eight points. Uh, registration uh, uh, favors the Democrats. Uh, but the question is, in, on this game day, who's going to show up? Uh, and as a special election, what, what often happens is turnout is dramatically lower, and pullout becomes a key ingredient. So can Nassau pull out the vote? And if they do, she will win. Mm. Uh, and if not, and, I, and let me just take, I know the word immigration. I think it's not immigration, it's the migrant issue that is really topical here. It's not your normal immigration conversation that we've had in this country for the last 30 or 40 years. It's where people come here illegally, they're sent to places like New York City, they're kicking cops in Times Square in the, in, on 830 you. And, watch, you. and watching, you know, so I think that's where, uh, that's where we're, where we're going to go. Yeah. Immigration uh, crime the issue as we count down to the end of voting. The first results in tonight's pivotal House race will be joined live by Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley, who's just days away from her next primary showdown with Donald Trump. Much more of our special election coverage ahead. Welcome back. We are counting down to the end of voting in a pivotal special congressional election in New York, the New York 3rd Congressional District, to fill, fill the House seat previously held by Republican Congressman George Santos until his rare expulsion from Congress in December. The GOP's razor-thin majority in the House of Representatives could be strengthened or diminished, depending upon what happens this evening. Both parties will be gauging the impact of divisive issues that are playing out in New York and nationwide, including immigration and inflation, abortion rights, the Israel-Hamas war. Tonight's special election comes, of course, as another momentous vote is around the corner, the South Carolina Republican presidential primary, which is only 11 days away. Joining us now from South Carolina, Charleston specifically, GOP presidential candidate and former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. Uh, Governor Haley, uh, thanks so much for joining us. I want to ask you uh, about tonight's race. The Republican candidate, Mozzie Pillip, took great pains to distance herself 
from former President Trump throughout this campaign. She was even reluctant to say whether or not she voted for him in 2020, though she did admit to uh, doing that uh, three days ago. What does that say to you about Trump and this seat? Well, it says that she's looking at past history. I mean, you look at the fact that he lost it for Republicans in 2018. He lost it for Republicans in 2020. He lost it for Republicans in 2022. <clears throat> but even look at last week. You know, he lost it for Republicans on a, on a border issue. He lost it for Republicans on an Israel issue. He lost his own immunity. And the party chair lost her job. I mean, everything that he is involved with with Republicans we lose. And I don't know how many more times we have to lose before everybody realizes that he's actually part of the problem. So early this morning, as you know, the U.S. Senate passed a $95 billion foreign aid package uh, to help Ukraine, Israel and Taiwan. Um, but even though it passed in the Senate with bipartisan support, uh, House Speaker Johnson says he's not going to bring this bill to the floor for a vote. Uh, instead, this evening, the House uh, spent its time impeaching uh, the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security and, and uh, Mr. Mayorkas. Um, obviously, that's not going to go anywhere in the Senate. I'm wondering what your reaction is to, to both of these uh, actions. Well, it shows the dysfunction of Washington, D.C., right? It shows the dysfunction of Congress. It shows the fact that they care more about peacocking than they do about getting anything done. But let's first say the number one priority is to secure the border, period. That's the focus that should be happening. We wouldn't be having all this if the focus would go back to the border. And you look at the bill that we had um, last week. It was weak in some ways. It was strong in other ways. But Congress should have stayed there and figured it out. The American people, both parties are saying, secure the border before something happens. Trump never should have come in and said, don't pass it until the general election. We can't wait that long. But pass a good bill, a strong bill, one that's going to actually protect Americans. You look at the foreign aid bill. And I look at why hasn't Joe Biden told Americans why they should care? Congress hasn't done it either. Tell people why they think Ukraine is important and the fact that helping Ukraine prevents war. Tell them why Israel is important, because it actually helps us avoid terrorism when we do that. Tell them all of these things while talking about the border. It's so disjointed what's coming out of Washington, D.C., from the president to Congress, that the American people don't know what to think anymore. Governor Haley, I want to follow up on something that you said earlier today. You said that you thought that President Biden should resign in the, quote, best interest of the country. Are you saying you don't believe he's able to serve out the rest of this term, the next 11 months? I mean, I think that Democrats see this for what it is, Dana. This is, I wish him well. I really do. But there's no way Democrats aren't totally panicking right now. I mean, you look at the special counsel report that says he's mentally diminished, but it's not just the report. We can look at him from two years ago. We can see that he's diminishing, but that's what happens when you're in your 80s. Those things happen. And I think the fact is we've got to put country above these people. Joe Biden has worried all about himself. Donald Trump is worried all about himself, but nobody's worrying about the American people and doing what's right. The party that lets go of their 80 year old candidate is the party that will win. And I think both parties need to realize that. But just to be clear, what Hugh Hewitt, who interviewed you this morning, said is that he wrote a piece arguing that by never mind the next election, that he should resign now. And it looked like you agreed with that. And you said that it, that would be in the best I interest do, of I the country. I do agree with that. So resign now. Kamala Harris should be president. I do I. I do agree with that. And listen, I am not excited about Kamala Harris being president. I think that that should worry everybody just as much because we've seen she couldn't handle the border. She couldn't handle artificial intelligence. We don't know. But at the same time, I look at how diminished Joe Biden is. And what bothers me is how does Russia see that? How does Iran see that? How does China see that? We have to look at this from a national security perspective. This is not about being nice to him because he's sweet and he's done his service and all that. This is yeah. about we need somebody at the top of their game making decisions on national security and the future of our economy. We don't have that right now. Governor, on national security, President Biden criticized Donald Trump today for suggesting that he would encourage Russia to invade NATO allies who didn't pay enough uh, in dues. Biden called Trump's comments dumb, shameful, dangerous, un-American. He sounds like what you've been saying about Donald Trump lately. 
Well, I think, you know, you look at what he said about NATO. It goes back to when Donald Trump leaves the teleprompter. He is unhinged. And we saw that. The idea that he would suggest to not defend our allies in NATO, but to go a step further and actually encourage Putin to invade our allies, the same allies that stood with us at 9-11, is unthinkable. But more than that, think of what he's doing. Donald Trump is siding with a thug that has caused half a million people in Ukraine to be wounded or killed. He's siding with someone who kills his political opponents. He's siding with Putin, who has arrested Evan Gersovich just for doing his job of journalistic right. um, journalism. I mean, he's siding with someone who has wanted to destroy America. That is not someone that you want at the top of the ticket. That's not someone you want to lead our country, and that's not someone who's going to prevent war. This kind of uh, these kind of comments that you just made now about Donald Trump, uh, co combined with uh, your reaction to what he said this week about your husband uh, being absent, even though he's uh, representing America and serving America uh, in in Africa in, in the military, made you say that you don't think that Donald Trump is qualified to be president. Are you rethinking your pledge to support Trump if he's the nominee? What I said is, if you look at what he said, look, it's not personal with me and Michael. We know that in politics, you get a lot of arrows thrown at you. It's not personal. And that's actually very different than Donald Trump, who takes everything personally. This should be about the American people. The problem with what he said is, if you mock one person in the military, you're mocking everybody in the military. This sacrifice, they don't make this sacrifice because it's fun or for kicks and giggles. They sacrifice and they're willing to shed blood because they believe that this is about something bigger than themselves. They know freedom is not free. And the right. fact that he would mock them. But this is a pattern that we've seen over and over again when he said that dying military members were suckers or losers or when he was at Arlington National Cemetery and he said what was in it for them. To keep saying these things is an insult to every military family who sacrifices when their loved ones go away. And that, how do you have someone who's going to lead our country when you don't think he's going to protect the people who are willing to make that, that extreme sacrifice? It's just very concerning. So it sounds like you are rethinking your pledge to support him if he's the nominee. What I'm thinking is y'all need to ask him what he has to say about that because he owes a lot of military families an explanation with that. He owes a lot of veterans an explanation on that. You don't disrespect someone who's done something that you weren't willing to do. He was not willing to go overseas, but supposedly because he had bone spurs. He's never been near a military uniform. He has no right to talk about anything that a service member does because that's off limits with him when he wasn't willing to serve himself. Governor, thank you so much for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Go to NikkiHaley.com. There is much more coming up in our special election coverage as voting is winding down in the congressional race to replace expelled Republican Congressman George Santos. Up next, the trail of lies and alleged crimes that stunned Santos's constituents and the so nation, finally persuading the even his fellow Republicans yeah, to move him yourself. from wait, Congress. Wait, wait, take the elevator. Calm down. Calm down. You guys got to let him... TikTok, time's running out for New York voters on Long Island and parts of Queens to choose a new representative in Congress. We are standing by for the very first results in this high-stakes special election to replace a famously or infamously expelled member of the House, now a criminal defendant named George Santos. There would not be a special election tonight if it were not for the George Santos saga. Manu Raju covered every moment of it. Manu, walk us through as many of the lies and allegations surrounding Santos as you can squeeze into a package uh, that doesn't last seven hours. And that did lead to his rare expulsion from the House. Yeah, look, the, he weathered the storm for months and weathered expulsion vote after expulsion vote. But at the end of the day, the criminal indictments on top of a damning House ethics report proved to be too much for Republicans and Democrats. George Santos left a historic legacy in his short time in Congress. George Santos is the Mary Magdalene of United States Congress. Just maybe not the legacy he would have wanted. He became the sixth member ever expelled from the chamber and the first to be expelled without being convicted of a crime or supporting the Confederacy. 
It all started with an unexpected rise. In New York's third district, George Santos, they pick up for the Republican Party. And a dramatic fall. In light of the expulsion of the gentleman from New York, and a disgraced congressman defiant until the end. I'm not going to sit here and continuously debate my entire life. Before his election in 2022, few had ever heard the name George Santos, and it might have stayed that way if not for a bombshell report about his background. A newly elected Republican congressman from New York is under scrutiny this morning. Major aspects of his resume are being called into question. Santos seemed to lie about virtually everything from his family. My grandparents survived the Holocaust. I'm a Latino Jew. My mom was a 9-11 survivor. To his education. They sent me to a good prep school. I actually went to school on a volleyball scholarship. I put myself through college and got an MBA from NYU. To his work experience. I was a party politician and I worked for Goldman Sachs. You worked for Goldman Sachs in New York? Yep. A picture of a man whose public face was built on lies. Lies that made him fodder for late night comics. I know how I'll be remembered as a martyr. I was the first openly gay Jewish Republican Latino to walk on the moon. I don't consider the things I've said to be lies. They're, uh, they're what my great grandfather, Winston Churchill, he would call them embellishments. And a pariah in Congress. He said embarrassment to our party, he's embarrassment to the United States Congress. Whose unpredictable antics kept everyone guessing. You guys are staying out here all day, so I just wanted to make sure you guys are taken care of. One of my staffers, baby, look at this baby. I want him out of here! He's an animal! But as the lies mounted, Santos admitted to fabricating some of his background. I always joke, I'm Catholic, but I'm also Jew-ish, as in ish. Did I embellish my resume? Yes, I did. And I'm sorry. It's insecurity, stupidity. I don't know. Look, I'm human. We make mistakes. But remained steadfast in rejecting calls for his resignation and was even preparing to run again in 2024. It's a great day to be an American. It's a great day to be a Republican. And it's a great day to announce re election. Before a sweeping indictment issued by the Justice Department. It's a witch hunt. It, it, it makes no sense. 23 charges in total embezzlement, wire fraud, money laundering campaign finance violations. The list goes on. Yet Santa survived not one, but two attempts to expel him, with many members waiting for the House Ethics Committee before taking action. But when the ethics report was released, it was explosive. There were hotels and taxi bills from Las Vegas charged to his campaign, makeup at Sephora, Botox even, OnlyFans charged to the campaign too. OnlyFans is a subscription-based risque website, a website that Santos swore he had never heard of in March, four months after his purchases. I just discovered what OnlyFans was about three weeks ago. The damning report turned the tide against Santos in the House. This is bullying. And when it led to another expulsion vote, it was a landslide. Santos seemed relieved to reach an end of his saga in Congress. Tell me what this year has been like for you. Hell. 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 Hell in the most profound way. Relishing his post-expulsion fame, doing interviews with comedians. The lesson is to stop inviting you places. But you can't. People want the content. And making money recording videos on the website Cameo. Well, happy, happy birthday! Or I can just do the happy birthday to you. Tonight's election is simply the latest chapter in this chaotic saga. A special election with a chance to shrink the House GOP majority to a razor thin margin. And possibly a first referendum on President Biden in this crucial election year. Wow. That was something. That was something to live through. <laughs> Joining us now, one of the most outspoken Republicans in calling for the ouster of George Santos, Congressman Mike Lawler uh, of New York. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining us, Congressman. First of all, as you know better than most, uh, there are a lot of House Republicans reluctant to kick Santos out of uh, the Congress uh, because of the very narrow majority Republicans have. If Mozzie Pillow, the Republican, does not win tonight, Will you regret calling for Santos to be ousted? No. Uh, it was the right thing to do. He was unfit to serve as a member of Congress. He not only defrauded the voters, uh, he defrauded donors, uh, stealing money uh, through shell companies, through the campaign. Uh, his treasurer pled guilty, a campaign staffer pled guilty to impersonating Kevin McCarthy's chief of staff. Uh, you have to have standards. 
Uh, and uh, ultimately, he was allowed and afforded due process uh, with the Ethics Committee, which is what many of my colleagues were concerned about. Uh, myself, Anthony D'Esposito, Nick LaLota, Mark Molinaro, we called for him to resign immediately when these allegations first surfaced uh, because from our own interactions, we thought there was something wrong with him. Uh, but ultimately, uh, when you see all the evidence that came out, putting aside all the litany of lies, but the criminal uh, evidence that came out, 23 felony counts, uh, he was unfit to serve. So I stand by uh, the decision to expel him. Uh, sometimes uh, you have to take a stand that's bigger than party. Uh, and frankly, when you see what's going on, for instance, in the Senate with Bob Menendez, uh, you know, people like John Fetterman are standing up and saying he needs to go. I think in Congress, if we want to restore the reputation of this institution and give the American people something to believe in, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. So to just taking it to where we are now, I mean, how much is what, I mean, that we saw in this, the chaos, the George Santos, the back and forth you had with the, G, with the GOP, how much is that affecting this race tonight? Uh, look, I, I honestly think uh, not very much. I, I think when you see the polls... Because, I should just interrupt because yeah. Mr. Swazi is trying to say she's another George Santos. We don't know anything about her past. Well, listen, voters know a lot about Tom Swazi. He's been in office for 30 years. He's lost five times. And tonight he's going to lose a six because Mazi is going to beat Swazi. And the reason is that the issues are on Mazi's side. Uh, when you look at the border crisis, when you look at uh, high crime in New York City, when you look at the affordability crisis, New York leads the nation in out-migration for a reason. It has nothing to do with the weather and everything to do with the cost of living. And so voters in the 3rd District are going to send a, a big message, like they did back in 2011 when Bob Turner won the special election to replace Anthony Weiner. Uh, this is going to be a big message that voters are dissatisfied with the president. They're dissatisfied with the governor and the mayor of New York City, and they want change. And Mazi Pillup, an Ethiopian-born, uh, you know, immigrant who went to Israel, served in the IDF, uh, came to America, mother of seven, served her local community, and unlike George Santos, actually is Jewish. Uh, she will do very well uh, tonight in this district. How did it change your vetting process? Meaning these voters are sort of owed an explanation as to how George Santos made it as far as he did. I have to assume going in this time around, maybe it was a little more aggressive. How did you yep. think about who you wanted to represent the district? Well, Chairman Joe Cairo, the Nassau County Republican chairman, uh, runs one of the best county organizations in America. Uh, and obviously, I think he was deeply uh, hurt by what happened. Uh, I know that they had a very thorough vetting process uh, in, in this uh, process to select uh, Mazi Pillow. Yeah, Santos slipped um, through twice. So. He did. And, and you know, frankly, <laughs> Tom Swazi is part of the reason that he was yeah. unvetted. Wait, yeah, Tom but Swazi isn't it admitted. you have one job? Tom Swazi, a candidate and make Tom Swazi admitted that they never did an oppo research book on George Santos when he ran in 2020. And to me, that's insane. I mean, I, listen, I've been a consultant, I've been an elected official. You do oppo research on your opponent. This was a failure on the part of both parties to vet uh, the candidate, both the Republicans who failed to vet him prior uh, and the Democrats who, I guess, took for granted that they were going to win a seat that Joe Biden won by about eight points uh, and just thought it would be a breeze. Uh, and frankly, the press, I mean, the national press and the New York press did not really do a, a good job. The local press actually did. But I'm asking uh, because and so, Swazi is now making an argument that who is this person? She is not out and about as much as she could be. She waited until the very last minute to really accept a debate. And so he's saying, look, yet again, there's another perfect resume. But what do we know about this person? Listen, with respect to debates, I mean, we can go through the litany of people who only accept one debate or multiple debates. Uh, that's not really what voters hang their hat on. Voters want to know what it is that you're going to do to help them. She has been working tirelessly across this district. I was there just a few weeks ago. We had over 1,000 people uh, at the uh, event uh, in support of her. She had another rally just the other day. She's out in the district, and she's serving as a local elected official. It's absurd to say that she's unknown. She's serving in her local community currently. Uh, Tom Swazi is somebody that people know. They've known him for uh, 30 years. He was elected the mayor of Glen Cove in 1993. 
He has lost five elections in large part because people know he's a phony. This is a man who literally bragged about kicking ICE out of Nassau County when he was county executive and now says that he's going to do something about border security uh, and the migrant crisis in New York. This is a man who voted 100 percent of the time with Joe Biden uh, while a member of Congress and now says, oh, I don't want Joe Biden to come to Nassau County. I, I don't want his support. Are you, are you kidding me? All right, Congressman, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Voting ends in New York just minutes from now and just in less than 12 minutes. And the strength of the Republican majority in the House is very much on the line. We are awaiting the first votes and clues about which party will prevail this evening. Also ahead, we're going to talk with one of the biggest names in New York's congressional delegation, Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, also known as AOC, is that standing what we by. Say Stay with us. And what we do does not matter so long as... Voting ends just minutes from now in this high-stakes special congressional election in the Long Island area of New York. The House seat previously held by ousted Republican Congressman George Santos. That's him right there. Remember him? Over two months after his historic expulsion from Congress. Many voters today looking to move past the Santos scandal as they choose between the Democrat, former U.S. Congressman Tom Suozzi, and the Republican, Nassau County Legislator Mozzie Pillup. Their close fight to represent the 3rd Congressional District will determine if Republicans hold on to this New York seat, expanding their slim seven-seat advantage in the House, or if Democrats pull off a win that chips away at that GOP majority as the polls are about to close any minute. Let's go back to a key voting location. John Berman is in Carl Place, New York. Uh, John, what's happening where you are and what happens next? Yeah, Carl plays high here, home of the frogs. It feels like last call, to be honest here, Jake. You can see the poll workers have already started to push the voting machines together. We did see one voter there getting his last minute ballot in. If you are in Carl Place, close by Carl Place High in the next six minutes, you can show up. Anyone in line at nine o'clock will be able to vote. But I will tell you, if there's no one here, they're going to shut this place down at nine o'clock sharp. Then the work begins here again. Every ballot that was cast here, and most of the people you see here are either poll workers or poll watchers at this point. Once the ballots are cast here, and you can look here, they are fed into these machines. And there are seven of these machines here. At 9 o'clock, once the polls close here, each one of these machines, they're going to close them up. They're going to take the paper ballots out, and they will print what they call tape receipts. And those will have the results, preliminary results, from each one of these machines. Here's one. Here's another. You can see they line the walls here, seven of them. From each machine, we will get the results, and they will be fairly telling. Just Election Day results, just Election Day results, and I can tell you on this machine, for instance, 103 ballots, 113, I'm sorry, 113 ballots were cast today. On this machine, 274 ballots were cast today. We'll get the results in about 15, 20 minutes from each one of these machines, and it will be telling. Why? Because the Election Day vote here has been low compared to normal elections. High for a special election, but low, especially in comparison to the early vote, early and mail-in vote. 80,000 people voted early or by mail. And the registration breakdown of the early vote, 46 percent Democratic, 32 percent Republican, the rest are other. So you get a sense, the election day vote, Republicans will have to make up Massey Pillip will have to make up significant ground in theory in the registration in the election day vote. And this is Nassau County, which is, over the last few years, traditionally more and more Republican. Will she have an edge here from these machines in the election day vote? That is one of the things we'll be looking for. If she doesn't have an edge or not a big edge, it may, it may give you a sign of where this night is headed, Jake. All right, John Berman, thanks so much. It's about to close down uh, in that voting place. You, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay there. John King, we're at the magic wall here. This is New York's third congressional district. What are you going to be looking for? You can stay there if you want to watch him count them. Watch John Berman do some math on live television. That'd be fun. Uh, uh, look, uh, John makes a very important point. Number one, uh, what is the final number, Jake, of the Election Day vote? Because we do know Republicans view it more as a holiday. They tend to more, be more traditional and vote on Election Day. We see that all across the country. Uh, if Democrats had an advantage in early voting, did the weather, 
Uh, did the fact that it's a special election, did that combination depress turnout, does that help the Democrat? We'll see. We'll be counting votes in just a matter of minutes. So you mentioned this is the district. Let's zoom a little bit. One thing interesting about it, John is in Nassau County. Let me just put the county lines up here. You see the line right here. This is Queens County. This is part of New York City. Uh, Queens County is part of Queens. Right? So you're on the edge of New York City. Tom Swazi has to run it up here. Uh, and we'll get some early votes here pretty early on. Uh, they're likely to be, when we get those early votes, they're likely to be lopsided Democratic. That's good for Tom Swazi, but remember, as we've seen in recent elections, especially since COVID, there's more early voting. It tends to be disproportionately Democratic, so that he needs that, but that doesn't mean, oh, game over. We have to count throughout the night. So you'll see that early on, but that's Queens County. Then you come over here. This is where John is out in Nassau County. Uh, this is where Mozzie Pillip just simply has to, you know, not only compete in the early vote when we start to see that, but run it up. But it is a different district in the sense that as you move away from the city, you get more suburban, and that is the tug of war. How is this district matter? Let me pull out a little bit, come back here. Just in New York, right? I'm going to show you in the country, we have so-called swing districts, right? These are districts, Republican-held districts that Joe Biden won, right? So you watch this right here. Let me come out and pull it out to the thing. Here, if this is this one right here is here. If you come back and look at the House of Representatives now, right? This one is here. We're looking at tonight. But then, if you pull it out, there are 17 of these. And so, will this district tell us anything about these? If you're the Democrats now in a presidential cycle, these are Joe Biden won these districts in 2020. Republicans won them in 2022. So, in the tug of war for the control of the House of Representatives, you know, Republicans are going for the narrow Biden wins, but the Democrats are trying to take them back. So, does this district in New York tonight? Tell us anything that you might apply, because many of these districts, like this one, are those competitive suburban districts, higher education, higher income, have been trending Democratic, but we have seen signs the Republicans are starting to pull them back. That tug of war gets one vote tonight, as we count votes in a bit. Congressman Mike Lawler, who we just interviewed, right. Republican uh, from New York, he also comes from one of those Biden districts. He sure does. He comes from right here. Uh, you come up here and look how close it was. He beat a very important member. Sean Maloney ran the Democratic yeah. Campaign Committee. House yeah, he campaign was a member committee. of the Democratic leadership. Yeah, a key Nancy Pelosi ally in the House leadership. Uh, look how close it was in the 2020 midterm. So Mike Lawler, one of the reasons he wanted to get rid of George Santos, I take him at his word. He thought George Santos was a disgrace uh, to the institution. He also wanted to get rid of him because of the baggage George Santos caused. Anybody who's running in a very competitive district does not want to, you know, you have to you want to deal with your own race. You don't want to be answering questions about somebody else at the same time. So he wanted to get rid of George Santos, number one, for the integrity of ins the institution. I do take him at his word. But number two, uh, those New York Republicans who led the charge, Jake, uh, they understood George Santos was an embarrassment, yes, but he was also a political liability. So again, in moments we'll get votes. This is all of the House districts. You see here that Biden won. Uh, tonight we're focused on this one right down here. Begins in the city, stretches out to Long Island, Jake. All right. Voting ends just moments from now. Three seconds. Look at that. In the contentious fight to replace ousted Republican George Santos in the U.S. House of Representatives. And here is our key race alert. It's too early to call. The special election in New York's third congressional district between Democrat Tom Swasey and Republican Mozzie Pillip as we watch the results come in. Remember, the outcome tonight will expand or shrink the GOP's narrow majority in the House. It will affect Republicans' ability to push through legislation or Democrats' ability to block it. Republicans currently have 219 seats versus 212 for the Democrats. We'll see how those numbers change in the hour ahead. Let's check in with our correspondents now who are on Long Island covering the candidates. CNN's Miguel Marquez is in Woodbury, New York, at the headquarters of the Democratic candidate, former Congressman Tom Swazi. Miguel, what are you hearing from the Swazi campaign about turnout and expectations? Uh, surprisingly, their, their sense of the expectation tonight is uh, very, very positive. I saw Tom Swazi earlier today. He said that because of the heavy snowfall early in the day that the numbers were down and most likely that was bringing down Republican voters. Uh, and it's not clear that uh, that has changed at all. I want to show you, as the party is ending for John Berman, the party here at the Swazi headquarters is starting to pick up. Uh, we also spoke to Jay Jacobs, who's the head of the Nassau Democratic Party and the state party. He says the numbers are looking exceptionally good for them, uh, much better than they were in 2022. Uh, he did say the one thing that they are watching for in this first data dump that uh, we are expecting to come very soon uh, are those unaffiliated voters and how they broke. The, the number of Democrats from early votes, absentee, and, and day of, uh, and day of 
are favoring the Democrats, but it's unclear how many Democrats are voting for Republicans. So that first dump will tell them that, and it will also tell them how unaffiliated voters are breaking. And they expect they will have, they seem to expect they'll have very good news. Uh, Tom Swasey, his campaign say that he, he expects to speak here at around 11 p.m. tonight, perhaps a little before, uh, expressing a sense of confidence mm -hmm. that they'll have a result by then. Jay? Thanks, uh, CNN's Miguel Marquez in Woodbury, New York. Let's go to Glen Cove, uh, New York, right now, with Shimon Prokopez is at a, a, a voting center. Uh, uh, Shimon, what's going on? Are they counting actual votes now? They are, Jake, and I want to show you behind me. These are the machines where folks have been submitting uh, their ballots to, and now they're starting to print. You can see here, uh, Millsy, why don't you come in closer here, and we can see that they are starting to print uh, the results here. And what's going to happen is, once that is printed, they are going to announce, they're going to say out loud what the results are. About 566 people voted here, according to the latest count from the machines here. Uh, and the doors have just closed. A couple of last minute folks walked in, they voted. And now we are in the process of watching them as this uh, process takes place here, as they start to tabulate these votes. This is another, there are three tables here. Uh, this is another table here, same process. They're going through uh, all the steps that they need to as they begin to print and start to count these uh, votes. And then there's another one here at the end as well. Uh, so the process is underway. In any minute here now, uh, we should know what the results are here uh, at this voting site, which has been relatively steady all day. Despite the snow, uh, it, it's been people have been coming in, they've been voting, it's been a pretty easy process, uh, and they've been. Uh, leaving. I also want to show you that you'll see there are some people here. These are actually representatives from the different parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, uh, the Democrats here. And so they will be also counting the votes and marking them down and then reporting it uh, to, to the leaders of the parties here. Shimon, we're going to come so right, we do, Shimon, we're we're come right back to you. Here. Shimon, we're going to come right yep. back to you. Uh, we're going to go to John Berman uh, right now, who's in Carl Place. Uh, and uh, get some numbers from him. Uh, John, uh, what's going on where you are? All right, this is the machine. This is Election District 47 in Carl Place. These are my friends Howard and Becky who have been working this machine. We have some results from the tape that was just printed out. Correct. Swazi, 53. Mazi, a total of 117. Okay, so that was 117 votes for Mazi. 170 votes total. total. One, 117 for Mazi Pillip. 53 for Tom Swazi. So you can see that machine by almost a two to one, over a two to one margin here in Nassau County in Carl Place went for Mozzie Pillip. I believe in this machine we're also getting results. Let me walk over here to my friend Brian who's been working this machine. This machine. The tape is just coming out of this machine now. Okay, good. So here we go, Mike. Here's, it's going out. It's reading out. My sweet Lord, look at that. There's our votes, 274. Okay, all right. Interesting. So Swazi pulled out 87 votes. Uh, his opposition, Maisie Phillip, 171 on the Republican, and then 15 as a conservative. Okay. Mazi Phillip, 171. Tom Swazi, 87. That's two of the seven machines here that tell a similar story, Jake. So you can see the election day vote breaking, at least here in Carl Place from these two machines, heavily for Mozzie Pillar. All right, John Berman, fascinating stuff. And let's bring you the key race alert right now because we have actual votes coming in. Let's take a look with 6% of the estimated vote in. Uh, Tom Swazi, the Democrat, uh, has 65.1% of the vote. Uh, Mozzie Pillip, uh, the Republican, has 34.9% of the vote. Tom Swazi with 7,586 votes. That's roughly 3,500 votes ahead uh, of Mozzie Pillip with just over uh, 4,000 votes. Remember, this is really early, and John was telling us that he expected a lot of those votes were going to come in from parts of Queens County, uh, which tends to be Democratic, and also this would be early vote, which would tend to be uh, Democratic. So this doesn't uh, mean anything uh, in particular, uh, what we just saw, those actual numbers uh, with uh, Mozzie behind Tom Swazi. Right. It, it means that Swazi's 
but based on that, doing roughly what he would need to do there, but that doesn't mean anything. Let me take off the county sign here so you get the full district, right? The reason you saw zero, zero there is because I had the county separated to make that distinction. But here's where you are right now. So you're the Democrat, Tom Swazi. You're ahead with 65% of the vote. That looks like a oh, wow. But to your point, uh, these are early votes. That's why they wrote a count so fast. They're already, you know, they're already in, and they haven't tabulated. They, can't, they just can't release that until after the election. They, but they haven't counted. They go boom. So New York's so, one of those states where you can count early votes ahead of time. Right, right. You just can't release them. Some states, you're not even allowed to count them until after the vote, right. the polls close. Right. And so I put up the county line here. I just want to make this distinction. So this disappears because we don't count votes by county. We count them by the district. So I just want to show you, though, what we're talking about. All the votes are coming from Queens County, which is the predominantly, overwhelmingly, Democratic area of the district. It gets more Republican, more competitive as you move out through the suburbs. So let's just take this off so you see it again. So it shows you that these are, you know, this is the, it's, you, see, you see the whole district blue right now. The reason I'm doing this is I just want to show that all the votes we have are from inside Queens County. So, right. so, so yes. Um, and just, to, just one note, because right. we, we saw votes coming in from where Berman was right. uh, in Carl Place, that is in the more Republican part because those votes were overwhelmingly more than two to one for Maza, Amazi uh, uh, Pella. Right, right. It was a modest number of votes from those couple of machines. But John Berman is out here in Nassau County. Shimon, you said you're going to go back to him when he gets it. He's up here in Glen Cove, right up here, part of Nassau County. So when, you're, when we go live to these polling places and our reporters are right there on the scenes, the value of having reporters on the scene, and the local officials read out those votes, then they have to get put through the tabulation and released by the party, and then they'll show up in the map. So sometimes we get numbers that are not yet officially reported. So we, as, as I said, we have nothing right now. If you look at our votes, if you just, I just want to come out to the whole district, we don't have anything from Nassau County yet in the system. That, that, that you saw them counting those votes online. There's just a process. They, they triple check the math, they put them into the system, and we'll get them. So this is, again, 6% of the estimated vote. That can fluctuate based on election day turnout. But if you're Swazi, sure, you got 65% of the early vote in Queens. The question is, is that their target? I assume they wanted to get two-thirds or more of that vote in the predominantly Democratic area. And now we wait, for, not only for the Election Day vote to come in, but there's also early votes out here in Nassau County. It's just Queens County was ready to go more quickly. But every vote counts. We're, right. just, we're underway. And it's a, roughly a pool of, we believe, about 160,000 people voted both leading up to today right. and uh, today. Let's go uh, back uh, to Glen Cove, to Shimon Prokopes. Uh, Shimon, what can you tell us about actual numbers coming in uh, from Glen Cove, New York. So two of the tables here have reported the numbers, and uh, what we have is 202 for Swazi and 142 uh, for Mazi Pillip. We're now waiting for the tabulations from the third uh, table here, and we should have that here any minute. Uh, they just posted it, but I can't show it to you, Jake, but I can read it uh, to you. Uh, it's... It says uh, Swazi 98, uh, and then it says uh, under the Republican ticket, Mazi Pillip 92, and under the conservative ticket, 12. So uh, those are the totals here uh, on, this on this third table. Swazi 98, and then 92 and 12 for Mazi Pillip. So, and Mazi's running so on both. What, about 104. Yeah, so, and, and Mazi's running on both, which is not uncommon in, in New York. She's running on two different party tickets, right? The Conservative Party and the Republican Party ticket. So you combine those, and she has 100 and, 104 votes. Is that right from that from that one district or that one voting machine? Yeah, one. I believe it's 104. 104. That's correct, Jake. 104 uh, from this third table. That plus additional to the 142 uh, uh, from the other two uh, voting districts here. Okay, John King, did you get those numbers? Or you want you want him to repeat it? We can get him to repeat it again. No, I'm, I'm just waiting to see them as they feed in. Cause okay. You see, as we have seen some a very modest some change, movement, right. very modest change in the vote total, but Phillips closing the gap just a little bit, and that's what's going to happen as these smaller precincts uh, start to report as they start to come in. And again, we, uh, earlier I showed you this, it's just to show the county breakdown here. Uh, we're waiting for more votes to come in out here. But the danger in this is that when you go to the county. It shows zero, so I don't. Right. I'm not going to do this that often because I don't want to confuse people at home to see them. They see zero votes, and then they see a lot of votes. I just want to make the distinction that that big early tranche of votes. You're just showing up, people that from, all the yeah. votes so far are from the Queens County part of the congressional district, but right. most of the congressional district is uh, uh, right. So, Nassau so, so County. you come out here. Yeah. So now, now we're waiting, and we'll see more of those votes tabulate as they come in. So that's probably the last time we go back there because it does confuse people when it goes back to zero here and then all of a sudden they see, you know, uh, 15,000, 16,000 votes. Uh, but when you see Shimon and John Berman on the ground, again, 
the reading out the machines totals there. And then they have to report it into the party. Then they're fed into the system, and they will start to post up as we go through it. Uh, but you know, we're nine percent. But the value is, you see, it's nine. It's what almost twelve minutes after the hour. We're getting votes. They're counting pretty quickly. Yeah, so we checked in uh, with Miguel Marquez, who was at Swazi campaign headquarters. Let's go to CNN's Lauren Fox now, who's at Mozzie Phillips headquarters. She's the Republican. She's in East Meadow, New York. Uh, Lauren, uh, what is the thinking inside Phillips camp? What are you hearing about voter turnout? Any goals they tried to reach? Uh, what's the story? Yeah, Republicans overall are watching this race really closely. And, Jake, they're nervous about the fact that turnout was low today. There was a snowstorm in this district. Obviously, that is having an impact on how many Republicans they were able to get to the polls. You heard from Mozzie Pillip earlier today. She was encouraging voters to get out on the road, saying it was safe to get out on the roads, and telling them that they needed to call and get a ride if they were uncomfortable. Because Republicans know that their voters vote on election. Day. That is why it's so important for them to have turnout. And when they're looking at the fact that turnout just wasn't what they wanted it to be, that makes them nervous. You know, I talked to one Republican operative who told me it would really suck to lose this race because of a snow day. But their argument is that's totally a possibility given the fact that weather was not on their side today. Now, there could be a number of reasons, right, why Republicans are losing. It doesn't all have to do with the snow. But I do think that that perspective is really interesting. Republicans also spent money to get snow plows out today. The Congressional Leadership Fund, a powerful super PAC, spent money to make sure the roads were clear. I think that shows you how important turnout is for Republicans today and why they were so concerned. So they're nervous. People are starting to show up at this election party. They're hopeful that Mozzie Pillip is going to be able to pull this off. But obviously, they are watching those numbers really closely, given the fact that they felt like they were doing well in terms of the pacing on early vote. They're concerned about what the numbers were today. All right, uh, Ms. Fox, we appreciate it. We're going to come back to you in a second. Both parties, of course, have poured millions of dollars in tonight's special election. Democrats more than Republicans, we should note. But it is a clear indication of the high stakes of the race. CNN's political director, David Chalian, is digging into all of this now. David? Yeah, Jake, I, I know there was snow this morning, but there have been a blizzard of television ads in this race for quite some time. And this was another place where Democrats had an advantage over Republicans. Take a look here at the spending you see. And we're talking about the Democratic candidate, uh, the DCCC, the House committee that is electing Democrats, the super PAC. The whole Democratic universe told it about $13.8 million of advertising compared to the whole Republican candidate campaign super PAC universe at $8.1 million. So big disparity there in ad spending. And take a look, Jake, at how the ad spending broke down by topic. Immigration, far and away, had the most money behind it. $12.4 million went to immigration. And by the way, that number, it split about two-thirds of that $12.4 million was Republican advertising on immigration. Only about a third was Democratic advertising on immigration. The rest there you see law enforcement at $5.6 million, abortion at $4.5 million, and it goes down from there. But clearly immigration front and center in this race. Anderson? David Chalian, thanks so much. In fact, let's show one of the ads, because both candidates were running, obviously, a lot of ads on immigration. That was the biggest one. Let's show uh, Pillip's ad uh, hitting Swazi on immigration. Biden's open border leads to violence right here. I support the president's agenda 100%. Tom Swazi, soft on illegal immigration, but tough on taxpayers. It, 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 you know, I think a lot of Democrats were thinking ahead of time, perhaps, that abortion would be the issue that would bring people to the polls here. It clearly seems to be immigration. Yeah, I think we've seen what's happened on the border has become such an issue. And it's not just because, you know, obviously New York is not a, a border place and it's not something that they've had to worry about. But they feel, voters feel like it's it's happening in their backyard, especially with the event that just happened last week in Times Square that you were referencing earlier. And I do think one piece of context is important here based on what Congressman Lawler said earlier, saying that he tried to kick ICE out uh, previously, Congress, or Tom Swasey. That was in a moment where he's explained that, saying that was because the ICE officers pulled their guns on Nassau County police officers, actually. The ICE agents did. 
And he's someone who resisted calls, actually, to defund ICE when that was a popular slogan among progressive Democrats. But he has walked, walked to this issue really carefully, and he has criticized President Biden on it. He said that the border should be temporarily closed. And you've just seen how Democrats are, are trying to run on this, and we'll see if, if it provides Let, a playbook. Let's take a look at Swazi's ad uh, that he ran uh, defending his own record on immigration. The southern border is 2,000 miles away, but the migrant crisis has landed right in our own backyard. In the past, I've worked with Republican Peter King on a compromise solution to the migrant problem. I'll work with anyone to get it done. That, that, that ad right there, plus another one on the ICE issue, Kaylin, that you referenced, where he shows a clip of himself on Fox News touting that he's one of the few Democrats willing to stand up for ICE shows you just how bad this immigration and border issue is for Democrats in swing districts. They sound, he sounds like a Republican. Well, I, and it's going to be... And, and I'm saying it, like, it's, like a, that's a bad thing. It, huh? Well, it's a good thing, but it's, it's, I'm just saying it's going to be that way in suburban swing districts all over the country, which is it's amazing because that's not where the energy of the Democratic progressive I'm, left is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, we're going to be able to fight Republicans to a standstill on the issue for a couple of reasons. First of all, Republicans gin this up. They're, they're, they're abusing human beings, shipping them up to, to blue states for political purposes, and then won't help them. And so now you have given us the opportunity to show that the Republican Party is politicizing the issue, doesn't care about the people, and Democrats are going to be tough on the border and also care about the people. This is not going to be the layup that the, Dem the Republicans think it is. You'll see that tonight. I, I think that the issue of helping them is trumped in a lot of these places by the issue of can't we just shut down the border until trying, we can figure out... We're trying to... Republicans won't... Hear, but this, this, this is my point. I, I, I don't, the, Repo I don't. the Republican Party has been, was begging, crying, saying... Please, we did, got to do something about the border. Terrorists are going to come up here. They're going to kill everybody. And Democrats said, you know what? Maybe you're right. Let's close the border. And Republicans backflip. Now, they're the ones running not to close no, the border. And what, Democrats are on the, on the right side of the issue. What would be interesting to me is whether or not... I mean, I, um, listening to you, Scott, say people are concerned about the issue. But the question is, what do they think the solution is? And I think this particular district is going to test whether or not the solution for wealthy, suburban, mostly white, but in this district, also Latino and Asian uh, voters, uh, is the solution to shut down the border or is it something else? And I, I don't know that the answer in the su suburbs of New York, even to the same problem, mm. is going to be uh, is going to be that or it might be something else. Maybe it's closer to what Tom Swazi is selling. I just think this particular district might be asking for solutions of a different nature. We're going to, we're going to go back to uh, Jake in D.C. Jake? Thanks, Anderson. Joining us now is one of the most high-profile members of the New York congressional delegation, Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, also known as AOC. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, do we have the latest votes? We don't have those yet? Okay, so let me just go dive into the interview. So President Biden won this district by eight points in 2020. Uh, now, uh, Congressman, former Congressman Tom Suozzi, a Democrat, is trying to get it back. Um, but he's distanced himself from Biden. He didn't want his endorsement. He didn't want him to campaign with him. Do you think that's okay if that's what swing battleground uh, district Democrats need to do to win? Well, you know, I think we, our main prerogative is to win the House back. I know that Representative Suozzi, former Representative Suozzi, he knows his, his district, he knows his territory. But I also think we can acknowledge the fact that we don't have to be afraid to be Democrats either. As you mentioned, President Biden won this seat by eight points. That is not one or two or three. That is a significant margin. And we also can run up the numbers with an enormous amount of enthusiasm, especially in a, in a special election like this, which is really about a base race between the two parties, getting out your most enthusiastic voters, especially on a snowstorm like this, and, um, and that's with messages on everything from abortion rights to making sure that we're having just solutions and comprehensive solutions on immigration that don't also have to just be on the defense. So uh, Pillip, uh, Mazi Pillip, the Republican running, mm -hmm. has tried to paint Swazi as a member of the squad, mm -hmm. which is your progressive uh, group. Uh, in their debate, Swazi distanced himself from, from you and the squad. He said, for you to suggest that I'm a member of the squad is about as believable as you being a member of George Santos's volleyball team, unquote. What do you, what do you make of, of her trying to tar him as a member of the squad? I, I mean, I, I would agree with, with Tom Swazi, the idea that we are, you know, that we're are part of the same kind of cadre in Congress is incorrect. It's wrong. Um, but... That doesn't mean that we're not on the same team. Uh, we're part of a democratic coalition that's a broad base. But I think it also shows that Mozzie's desperate 
Uh, you don't go for those enormous reaches that are frankly so laughable, especially to the people of Queens and Long Island who know Tom Swazi. He had 80% name ID going into this race. To claim something like that in a backyard that knows him is... It, it, it really shows that they're reaching um, and that they're pretty desperate to try to land a punch there. Well, the, the way he's been campaigning is he sounds like a conservative Queens or uh, Long Island Democrat. That's what he yeah. sounds like. He's, he yeah. sounds conservative on the border. Um, what do you make of that? And what do you make of the border issue as the last week has, has played out and Republicans originally demanded border be added to the foreign uh, aid bill and then they didn't want the border mm -hmm. compromise? that probably was too conservative for you, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now they're even rejecting to vote on the foreign aid bill. Talk about the, the border part of it, and then we'll talk about foreign yeah. aid. Well, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a gamble, but also this district is very complex. It's right here in our, in our backyard in New York City. You have a district that spans parts of New York City and Queens, but also reaches all the way out to Nassau County. There are parts of this district that are quite conservative and parts of this district that are very, very progressive. And so to be able to thread that needle and try to achieve turnout is, is a very challenging, uh, it, it's a very challenging, you know, feat to, to be able to accomplish. Now, I do think that we need to be careful to not demobilize parts of the Democratic coalition, especially young voters, voters of color, um, because you have to run up your numbers in places like Queens in order to help um, buttress against any evenness in Nassau County. If the, the bill that passed the Senate early, early this morning, $95 billion to, for aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, if that were to be voted on in the House, mm -hmm. which is a big if, because it's it doesn't sound like the speaker if. wants to do it, but the Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, your fellow New York Democrat, he wants that to come to the floor. If it came to the floor, would you vote for it? I, I don't think I could bring myself to vote for it. I think that the provisions in the bill from not just the border, or not just uh, uh, the provisions that we see across the board, but especially when it comes to foreign aid, the, the increased restrictions on UNRWA funding, the UN refugee uh, assistance funding, the complete lack of humanitarian aid, especially on the heels of, of this invasion on Rafa, I think we are at a point where we have to do something to protect innocent people, innocent lives of Palestinians in Gaza. And I'm very concerned about the Netanyahu, the Netanyahu administration's lack of restraint and their stated intent and lack of regard for, for saving innocent lives. I asked Senator Chris Coons about uh, the foreign aid bill, and I, I'm going by memory here. Uh, I'm not 81, but my memory isn't always perfect. And uh, I think he said that there was $10 billion in aid for humanitarian aid for Gaza. We'd have to see, but as it stands, the, the UNRWA is the number one central corridor for humanitarian assistance to enter uh, to enter Gaza. And so to see how it would be structured, you know, this is something that is, I think, of prime concern. And to also block off the main corridor, corridor of humanitarian aid is a major, major move um, from the U.S. Congress, especially that it's predicated on allegations that are still being investigated. But as those investigations continue to go on, the basis of them uh, do seem to be eroding. And so we have to ask ourselves, mm -hmm. why? Why would we do that? So um, before you go, uh, there have been a lot of questions, especially since that special counsel report last week mm -hmm. that cleared uh, President Biden of any wrongdoing legally, but mm -hmm. certainly impugned uh, his memory. Mm -hmm. And this come, that came on the heels of just a few days before him uh, talking about conversations he had in 2021 with world leaders who had died several years before that. He was mm -hmm. confusing world leaders. Tom Swazi uh, told a local news station when this question was raised about Biden, quote, the bottom line is he's old. I mean, he's 81 years old. Um, he wouldn't say, Swazi, whether Biden would be the Democratic nominee at the party convention in August. Um, do you have any concerns about his age? Do you have any concerns about whether or not he should be the nominee? I mean, I think right now when it comes to the president's age, folks are talking about how he's 81, but we have to look at, first of all, Donald Trump is around the same age as 77, yeah. He's 77 years old. They could have gone to high school together. And beyond that, Donald Trump has 91 indictments. And 
what I know who I'm going to choose. It's going to be the one of the most successful presidents in, in modern American history that pla that passed the Inflation Reduction Act, that got us the American Rescue Plan, that ensured that we could pass one of the largest federal investments in climate change in U.S. history. And as far as we go, as we know, uh, virtually all the filing deadline deadlines have passed. There's already been a primary. Voters have outright rejected Dean Phillips. President Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee, and hopefully he'll be reelected as president of the United States. Are you worried about at all about these challenges from the left? Jill Stein, Cornell West. I don't know where RFK of, Jr. is, you know, whether he's left, right, or center, but... But there is a real fear that they could take votes away from Biden. And that is real. That is real, especially in states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, critical swing states. Uh, but we need to understand what we are staring down in this country. If Donald Trump is elected president of the United States, we do not know if there will be a verifiable next election that has integrity. He already tried to, uh, we saw on January 6th, he tried to overturn the results of a presidential election by force, by inciting a riot. And I, you know, I think we need to be very, very realistic about the grave, grave impacts of a Donald Trump election. It is not a joke. It is not a game. We need to protect our democracy. And ideally, it's going to be on progressive values. Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, always good to have you. Thank you so much. It's still very early in this special congressional election with the strength of the Republican majority in the House on the line. We're standing by for more votes to come in after this quick break. I have another key race alert for you fine folks. Let's take a look at what's going on with 13% of the estimated vote in. Co former Congressman Tom Suozzi, the Democrat, is ahead with 61.8% of the vote. He has 15,248 votes. It's about 5,800 votes ahead of the Republican. Mazi Pelop, uh, that's with 13% of the vote in right now. Uh, John King, uh, what is going on where you are? Where the Oh, I see like more votes are coming in from Nassau County. You can't sneak that by me. I saw it. It's good when you walk over. That's observant. We're, uh, let's stay the district wide first, then we'll get into that. But yes, okay. we are starting to see more votes come in. Now, if you're Tom Swazi, you've opened up an early, healthy lead. Uh, to those of you at home, that's what you want. You'd, ra you'd rather be on top. That's about, we're roughly around 13% of the vote, so we got a long way to go. So you see the whole district here filled in blue. I just want to split it by county to make the point you were just talking with the congresswoman. Uh, this district uh, has a base here in New York City, sort of the easternmost part of New York City, Queens County, Queens. Uh, Tom Swazi is getting 62% of the vote to 38% of the vote, if you round that up there. And this is where the big vote totals are so far. Just remember these numbers. He's got almost 15,000 votes. Uh, she's got nine. Then you come over to Nassau County. We're just very early in the count in Nassau County. Uh, 709 votes when you match it all up. 57% you know, for her, 43% for Swazi. But it does tell you we're starting to get, we just saw numbers change right there. Uh, the numbers just change as we're here. So the votes are starting to come in from Nassau County, and it's pretty obvious the challenge. As the votes come in here, number one, how high is the turnout? Number two, if he's getting 62%, we're up to about 80% there, we think, right? So that's, they dropped a bit, but he stayed above 60%. If he's getting above 60%, closer to 63, 64% of the vote here, then simple math, she's got to match it and run it up here, and she needs the turnout. Uh, this is a populated, very you know, urban, area of the, urban area of the district. She needs in this big suburban area for turnout to be up. And our correspondent, that was a concern raised by our correspondents, both Shimon and John Berman, on the ground. Republicans do tend traditionally to honor voting on Election Day. They think it's more cool, uh, traditional to vote on Election Day. Did, we, did they turn out? Did they get there? Now, very early. But we think we're about 1% in the Nassau County part of it. So we got a ways to go. But if the Democrat has a giant base in the urban area of the district, the Republican better run it up in the suburbs as those votes come in in the time ahead. And that's when you pull out to the whole district. There's where we are, about 14%. Yeah, about so there are the two factors here that, that uh, what I'm hearing from you and from our correspondents on the ground are, A, geography, that, that Swazi right. does better closer to Manhattan and Pillip, Mazi Pillip does better uh, the farther out you get, but B, also uh, when people voted. Because John Berman said that about 80,000 people voted before Election Day, right. and Democrats appear to be winning those, at least according to party registration as right. to who voted. That means 80,000 people voted today, and that would mean that we would, we would, uh, the con um, Pillip, uh, Mazi Pillip right. would hope that she matches that uh, on the other side in terms of the proportion of Republicans versus Democrats right. vote. And, and to do that, she's going to have to pull people back to the Republican fold. 
voters who, if we go back to the George W. Bush days, before that Ronald Reagan, George H. W. Bush days, George Pataki, one of his governor days, uh, suburban Republicans, right? affluent people with college education, upper middle class, to even higher than that, uh, who were Republicans, who became Democrats in the Obama and the Biden years in there. Uh, some of it is the running from Donald Trump. A lot, of right. a lot of suburban Republicans ran from Donald Trump. Can she pull them back? To that point, just to make, you know, make the point in this district, uh, come on back come on, for me here. What am I doing here? All right, doesn't want to come out. Well, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But this is this runs, the education level in this district runs about one and a half times the national average, the percentage of people with a bachelor's degree or higher. More than one and a half times the national average, the percentage of the income, median income of this district. So can she get people who, uh, come back to the county line, she's winning right here now, but it's a thousand votes. Uh, right. You know, but but can, can she keep a, keep this red and keep it red? This, this is where, you know, Joe, you mentioned in the interview with the Congress. Republican congressman and the Democratic congresswoman, Joe Biden carried this district by eight points. Uh, was 2022 a blip? The New York Democrats had a problem drawing the map. It was the midterm election. Was that the blip? Or are the suburbs starting to trend back to the Republicans? Can she hold it? That's one of the questions tonight. That's the big mystery we're going to see, and we expect more votes to be reported very soon. We'll see if Tom Swasey's lead holds or if Mozzie Pillow closes the gap in this high-stakes special election. Our coverage continues right after this. And we're back. We have another key race alert for you. With 14% of the estimated vote in, Democrat Tom Suozzi remains in the lead with 61.1% of the vote. That's 15,552 votes, roughly 5,600 votes ahead of Republican Mozzie Pillup with 38.9% of the vote. But it is early yet. There is still a lot. There are still a lot of votes to count. Now, uh, let's go to Kristen Holmes. Now to the Trump factor, how it is and is not playing out in the special election. CNN's Kristen Holmes is in West Palm Beach, Florida, covering the Trump campaign. And Kristen, Donald Trump, he's pretty much stayed away from this race. In fact, uh, it wasn't until a few days ago uh, that Ms. Pillip uh, acknowledged that she voted for Donald Trump. She did so uh, reluctantly. That's right, Jake. Mozzie Phillip was eager to avoid talking about Donald Trump, and Donald Trump and his team were more than happy to avoid wading into this race. If you'll remember back in 2022, former President Trump tried unsuccessfully to wield political power with a number of endorsements that ended up losing in the general election. That gave of Republicans a lot of blame on Donald Trump for those lackluster results in those midterms. They want to avoid that now, particularly as Donald Trump is, seems to be headed towards the nomination. I talked to a senior advisor tonight who said that they are being much more cautious about who they give endorsements to, what races they wade into, and this is part of that, that they, this is not a sure thing, and they believe that if Mozzie Phillip is to lose, that Donald Trump would be blamed if he did endorse her. So they want him staying out of this race. Now, I do want to point out one thing. Now, Donald Trump might have stayed out of the district, but the district didn't totally stay away from Donald Trump. There was a notable guest at Trump's victory party in New Hampshire. A disgraced congressman, George Santos, was dancing in the crowd and celebrating when he won the New Hampshire primary. All right, Kristen Holmes, thank you for not showing a clip of that. I appreciate it. Uh, joining me now, one of the New York Republicans who voted to oust George Santos, Congresswoman Nicole Naliotakis, who represents nearby uh, Staten Island. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Quick question, and then I want to uh, let uh, Jeff have the second question, which is the same question I asked Congressman Lawler. What if uh, Swazi wins? What if the Democrat wins? Will you regret your push to get George Santos out of Congress? Look, uh, we, we had to get rid of George Santos. Uh, what he did was wrong. It was unethical. It was illegal. Uh, and we had done the right thing. We had sent it to the Ethics Committee. We asked for them to thoroughly investigate it. They did, and they came back and was able to show us the receipts that he indeed was uh, using his campaign uh, donations inappropriately. He even stole from a fellow colleague a credit card number and was charging things. So it, it, that was that has to be past us. We need to move forward. It would be disappointing if we didn't hold the seat, obviously, um, but there's always November. Uh, I do believe that it's still early in the night. I think that the numbers that you're seeing are because Queens has come out strong early. We've always expected that we weren't going to win the Queens part. Remember, they're almost done now, Queens. It's almost all counted. And the rest is going to be Nassau County. I think there was, last I checked, was 2% only in for Nassau County. We expect Mozzie to do very well. And so I think the night is still early and she can win this race. 
And if she does win this race tonight, what do you think this will tell us about uh, former President uh, Trump's uh, role in the suburbs? Uh, will too much be read into this? As Kristen was saying, he's largely stay out of this. She did not even say she voted for him. So can you really read a lot into the outcome of this election vis-a-vis -vis Trump? Yeah, I think this election is less about Trump and more about what's happening in New York. I mean, people are really upset with what's happening. This, this migration crisis that's happening, crime, the assault of those police officers by individuals that many people believe should not be here. Uh, that's, that is all part of the issue. The fact that New York doesn't cooperate anymore with ICE detainer requests to deport criminals, that's a factor here as well. But I do think that uh, if you look at Nassau County, how it's trended over the last two cycles, Republican, they flipped everything. They flipped everything from the county executive to the county district attorney to the county legislature and won a bunch of those local little t town supervisor seats as well. So I think that's telling it, that Nassau County is trending very much Republican. How about those other key New York races, though? Is he still a drag on the uh, ticket in the fall or too soon to say? I, I don't think so. I think things have changed significantly. I think there's a lot of buyer's remorse for President Biden. Um, if, if you look at in my district, for example, I mean, I mean, Trump did win my district, but what I will say is he's very much in the tank, President Biden. I mean, they, probably a 33% approval rating last we checked. Uh, and that is not good, I think, overall. And I think a lot of things have changed, right? President Biden has had the opportunity to govern. And I think there's a lot of people in these districts that are not happy. They're paying more in terms of food costs. They're seeing the, the border crisis continue. It's now come to New York. Uh, they're still upset with crime and the bail law that the governor put in place where she almost lost last year. So I think there's a lot of things that are happening locally, which is why New York trended different than a lot of other parts in the country where we won a lot of seats in New York, where we were losing in other seats that we thought it was going to be a red wave and we didn't win those areas. Yeah, no, that's very true, Congresswoman. But you, of course, are talking about a lot of the issues that are driving voters in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. You live there and you've been watching what's happening in New York 3. But talk about it vis-a-vis -vis what you do here in Washington mm -hmm. and how is there anything that you see trending there besides immigration that gives you pause as a Republican in a very, very narrow majority? Well, look, I think right now what you're seeing, we have that narrow majority and the Senate obviously is, is split. Uh, so everything that you're seeing happening, whether it's avoiding the default, whether it's uh, avoiding the shutdowns, whether it's making sure that we pass the NDAA, which we did, now we're gonna go on to FISA and some other stuff. It's all gonna be done in a bipartisan manner. I mean, the bottom line is you're gonna see, as you've been seeing this year, far right, far left vote against these things, and the vast majority of the middle, over 300 members, vote for these things. And so you're going to see, I think, more bipartisanship, actually, as a result when it comes to getting these things done, like just like the tax plan that we passed last week that expanded the child tax credit, that uh, reinstated some of those winning provisions for the economy for our, our small businesses rely on, uh, the R&D tax credit and those things. Those, that was done in a bipartisan way, bicameral, right? So I think anything you're going to see for the remainder of the year has to be I can't in a bipartisan you didn't way. Salt. Well, salt. Uh, <laughs> we're taking a vote tomorrow on the rule. We'll see. But I think 2025 is the year the for salt. It's not going to pass. Okay. It. I, I think there is a problem there. But 2025 <laughs> is the year where the salt provision expires, and I think that's where the New York members are going to have their most leverage. Uh, to get something done for our constituents. Salt, of course, a reference to state and local taxes. It's a thing that we'll go into that later. <laughs> Congresswoman Amelia Takas, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank really you. appreciate it. As more votes come in, how are the candidates feeling about the race right now? We're going to check in with the campaigns and stand by for more numbers on this suspenseful special election night. That's all ahead. More votes are coming in, so we got another key race alert for you. Let's look at the big board. With 14% of the estimated vote in in the congressional race, the special election in New York's third, Democrat Thomas Swazi has 61% of the vote. 15,592 votes. That is 5,615 votes ahead of Republican Mazi Pillup, who has 39 percent of the vote. I will remind you, it is early yet. It's only 14 percent of the vote. And we did expect Democratic votes to come in more heavily early on. Let's check in with John Berman now. He has now moved to the Nassau County Board of Elections in Mineola, New York. John, uh, what is happening in Mineola? To be, it's all happening, first of all, Jake, in Mineola. We're at the Board of Elections in Mineola. All the votes from Nassau County are coming here. 
to this loading dock outside. You can see that car pulling up right there. That car, we believe, well, each one of the cars that does pull up here, there have been quite a few that are coming up, they hold all the voting materials for each of the election districts, which you might know as precincts from around Nassau County. Each one of the cars is unloaded with those voting materials. Okay, here we go. You're seeing this. You can see right there those red pouches on top there. Those red pouches hold the flash drives. Remember, I was at those voting machines earlier in Carl Place. Each one of those red pouches has a flash drive from one of the voting machines. The yellow bag holds absentee ballots that were delivered to each of the polling places today. We'll walk in. Once they arrive here at the loading dock, they come in here. This looks like a, a cage, like an evidence room from the wire or something, but it's behind this cage where all of these flash drive pouches are scanned in right there. You can see them being scanned in like at a supermarket checker. That's to make sure that each one of the machines produces a flash drive that can then come here and be counted. The pouches are then opened. You can see the flash drives being taken out in some cases. And then the flash drives themselves are taken into a room in the back where we are not allowed. Most of the people here are, in fact, not allowed. That's where the officials here in Nassau County put the flash drives into the computer and count the votes themselves. At last count, we had 25 or so in. I imagine we're up over 50 now of these flash drives. So they're getting up there in terms of the votes coming in here to Nassau County, loading them into the computer, and then they will be counted. What we're going to try to do is get an early read, if we can, on what the actual votes are, Jake. But it is interesting seeing the process at work here with the votes literally coming in here to Nassau County. Fascinating stuff. John Berman uh, also wearing a red cravat as a style homage to George Santos, perhaps. Uh, John King, uh, let us know more about the votes coming in, where they're coming from, who they're going to. Very quick point. I've made it before. I want to make it again. Those are amazing people doing yep. the work of democracy. There are people in our politics, including a former president, who pummel them all the time. Uh, they're doing their work. I don't know if they're Democrats. I don't know if they're Republicans. They're counting votes, and they're doing it the way it's supposed to be done. Amen. Uh, uh, where are we right now? So we're at 61% for Tom Swasey to 39% uh, for Mazi Pillip. We're at about 14% of the vote. We are, it's, an, it's a special election, so that's an estimate right now. So if you're looking at this, and you've been with us since we started counting votes 55 minutes ago after the polls closed, you said, oh, he's above 60% for the whole hour now, pretty much. So that must mean he's going to win. Let's slow down. Let's slow down. Number one. We're early. We've got 80% of the vote plus uh, still to count. Number two, remember, we talked about this earlier. This district is divided. This is Queens County, New York City. I'll pull this out here. This is Queens County, New York City. Tom Swazi is running 62% of the vote there. Running it up in the urban New York City part of the district like a Democrat has to do, right? But she's getting 40%. So just look at that vote total. 15, 9, Right, 82% report. I just want to go back two years ago. Now, this is a special election, so the numbers won't exactly match up. The turnout tonight is not going to be the same as the 2022 midterms. We don't expect it to be anyway. But in the 2022 midterms, okay, Robert Zimmerman was the Democratic candidate. He won Queens County with 52%. So Tom Swasey right now is overperforming Robert Zimmerman, who lost. Uh, so Tom Swasey, that's good. You're overperforming the last guy. But just look at the total there. 48, close to 49,000 votes when you add all that up there. Come over to Nassau County. This is where George Santos won the seat because he won out here more than four th times as many votes were cast in Nassau County than in Queens County, part of the district. So come back to where we are tonight. We're only at 1% here, right? F Philip is wanting 57% to 43%, but so Swazi is winning 62%, but we're almost done counting in Queens, right? We're almost done, not almost done, but you're, at, you're most of the way at 80%. Then you come here, we're just getting started. So. You're at 80%. You're just getting started. There is plenty of time, plenty of votes out here in a much larger, more populated part of the district. Two years ago, four times as many votes cast yeah. in this part of the district. Right now, we only have 1,000 votes and some change. So can you go back to Queens County for one second? Okay. So 82% of the vote in, and it's roughly 20. 4,000, 25,000 votes. So we expect it's going to be a little bit over 30,000 votes uh, will be from Queens County. Right. And we think, based on what John Berman told us earlier, that about 160,000 people voted. Right. So it really the question is just what that huge chunk, how many of them voted, and, and they're all in Nassau County. Yeah, they would be in Nassau Again, in the 2022 midterm election, more than four times, not quite five times as many, more than four, but well in excess of four times more votes cast here than here. 
So the question is, does that hold true tonight? If it does, and she stays at, you know, again, this is 1,000 votes and change. So she's at 57%. If she stays at 57% and all those, there's enough votes out there, well, guess what? She's going to come back and pass. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that because we are so early in the count, and, and John just showed where he was. He's in Mineola, which is right down in here. Forgive me if you live in Mineola, if I'm an inch or half an inch off there. But Mineola is right about down here. That's where the Board of Elections is. You saw that happening right there, you know, the scanning, bringing everything in. That's the integrity of the election process. But guess what? It also tells us, now that we see them coming in, you put the flash drive in the machine, and the count can come pretty quickly once they have them in that central counting location. It takes a while to get in there. You see the, the, the old mode of transportation, right? You drive, them, you drive them and you get them there. But I would expect qu quite quickly the Nassau County numbers, the Nassau County pieces of this are going to change pretty quickly. We're at 1,050, you know, 1,059 votes. Uh, that's going to change pretty quickly. And when it does, that's when we will know, you know, does that change? Yeah. What else can you tell me about this congressional district? Can you tell me who they voted for for president in 2020 and 2016? I know the congressional districts changed. The districts changed, and, and especially the New York City maps have changed. But we can go back in time to the degree that we can. I mean, if you come back to 2020 in this district, uh, Joe Biden, well, you have to come in and carry, look at the district. Nassau, you can do it by county. The congressional district, well, I can probably find the CDs if I can. See if my CDs are still in. Sorry, see, I, I did yeah. not prepare yeah. for this. That's okay. That's okay. But you can look. You can look roughly here. Nassau County. Joe Biden won the county, which is again, to your point, right? A little off, but this is this is when the suburbs abandoned Donald Trump, and Donald Trump narrowly won the suburbs nationally in 2016 against Hillary Clinton. Yeah. They abandoned him in 2018. That's why Nancy Pelosi was speaker. They abandoned him in 2020. This is New York. Joe Biden was going to win New York anyway. But to, to that point, if you go back in time, you come here 2016, you know, Nassau County, it's closer. You know, you see there, you come through, uh, just to, you want to go way back in time. Uh, Bill Clinton won this area pretty decisively. So not exactly the greatest analogy that way because the maps do change. But as we look in here, let's just come back in and see if the numbers have gone up at all. We are stuck right here still, 61 to 39 in the race right now, but a very important point, most of the vote is from the Queens part of the district, very little of the vote from the much more Republican suburban area. Jake, hopefully we get more count just in the minutes ahead. All right, John King, and if you're just joining us, we are covering the special election to fill the House seat previously held by ousted Republican George Santos. And right now, we have another key race alert for you. Let's look at the big board here with 14% of the estimated vote in. Con former Congressman Tom Suozzi, the Democrat, has 61% of the vote to the Republicans, 39%. Suozzi has 15,592 votes. He's 5,615 votes ahead of Republican Mozzie Pillip, who has 9,977 votes. It is early yet. We expect a lot more vote counting to happen tonight. I want to check back with our correspondents who are covering the candidates. First, we go to Miguel Marquez. He's at Swazi's campaign headquarters in Woodbury, New York. And uh, Miguel, what is the Swazi camp's take on the numbers so far? Utter confidence. I want to show you this room right now and how it is just filled up. And the Swazi campaign saying that they they seem to be everything they are saying seems to be that they are very, very confident that this vote is going to go their way. So confident, in fact, you know, we spoke to Jay Jacobs a short time ago. He's the head of the Democratic Party here in Nassau and in New York State. Uh, he is very confident that the early votes and those early ballots, they say that they are getting the, some of those numbers already. They're starting to see some of those numbers, and they like the way that they are breaking for them, uh, and that in the next few minutes that Jacobs and Tom Suozzi will come out and they will address this crowd. They have said all along that they did not expect to do that unless they were certain of a result. So we expect to hear something uh, from the Swazi campaign very, very soon, from Swazi himself uh, very, very soon. Look, he has run a very tight, very sort of centrist, uh, very uh, aggressive campaign. Uh, and, and millions and millions of dollars have been spent across the board here. So they are hoping that uh, the result is theirs tonight. Jake. All right, Miguel Marquez, thank you so much. And we have another key race, key race alert for you right now because while Miguel was talking, a lot of votes came in. We are now above 50% of the estimated vote in, 51% to be precise. And Democrat Thomas Suozzi maintaining his lead. He has 58.7% of the vote. He is 55,154 votes. That's how many he has. That is 16,311 votes ahead of the Republican, Mozzie Pillip, 
who has 38,843. That's with 51 percent of the vote in. Uh, Swazi with 58.7 percent and uh, Pillup with 41.3 percent. So that's a lot of votes. It, uh, she still could, you know, she still could make it up. But but if I were, I'd rather be Congressman, former Congressman Swazi than uh, Mozzie Pillup right now with a majority of the votes in. Absolutely. Half the vote. If you got about half again, again, this is an estimate. It's a special election. So, there, you know, there, there'll be a tiny little bit of wiggle room just there because the turnout's unpredictable. In a special election, you're making an estimate based on turnout. But you're exactly right, especially as you approach what you believe is half the vote or more. When you've got a significant lead, it's just simple math. It just gets hard to cut into. Now, just one point to make, when you have the votes bring into the central location in Nassau County and reported and you get a big number of votes like that, um, nine times out of ten, that is the early vote. That, yep. is, that, is the, that is the early vote that has been tabulated. They just can't release it until they get it to the central location, and they go. Uh, so uh, you know, it, it's, it, they're all votes. They count. So if you're Swazi, Democrats, especially since COVID, disproportionately win the early vote. So we need to watch and see as it balances out. But to your point, break it up by county. Uh, now we have a significant amount of votes. Remember, just moments ago when we only had 1,000 and change, uh, the Republican candidate was winning in Nassau County. If it stays this way, and so if, if Nassau County stays blue, Swazi wins the election because we know Queens is going to stay blue. Right. Uh, so if Nassau also stays blue, this is where you'll have much more of the votes, perhaps as many as four times as many votes here cast here. So if Swazi keeps Nassau, the Nassau County part of the district blue, just you, know, you don't need to know the math. This is probably, as you note, though, mostly early vote, right? Which they, about 80,000 right. out of the 160,000 right. were early. And we know that, generally speaking, most of those were Democratic voters. So this is not a surprise. But this margin right. is really surprising. That, that, that is the key point. So on the one hand, you're a Republican. You say, this is the early vote. It's going to the Democrat. That's OK. We'll get it back with the Election Day vote. OK, you can, but you're exactly right. You're, so you, you, can, you can get it back, but that means you have to beat that. That means uh, in the election, you know, if, that's, if that's the early vote, you know, on the Election Day vote, you've got to beat, you got to get 58 percent or more. Um, that's a big number, right? That's a big number. And if, you know, so, yes, this ten, the early vote does tend to be disproportionately Democratic, but in the end, it's still math. Uh, and you've opened, you know, those votes all count, and you've opened up that lead. So now we need to see as you go from there. We believe, we believe, this is up, we say, 82 percent of the estimated vote. Uh, we believe we're pretty close to done for the night in Queens, too. So we don't expect the Queens part of the district, we don't expect more votes to come in. We think we're close. So this is, this, this is the game now. As the votes come in in Nassau County, we think we're around 45 percent. These came in pretty quickly, as we saw with John Berman on the scene there, the flash drives, the disks, the backup materials showing up there. So we watch as this continues. Come out to the full district. There's your math. 59-41. If you're Swazi, you're happy, but you want to see, you want, you want to know from your people on the scene, Jake, and some of these key precincts that, okay, now we're seeing Election Day votes. Yeah. Uh, if you keep that lead or you, you only lose a little bit of that percentage as you see more Election Day votes, that's when you start getting more confidence. So let's find out where this big amount of vote, this vote dump, as they call it, uh, just came in from. We actually have a correspondent slash anchor at the site of the Nassau County Election Board in Mineola, uh, New York. John Berman, we just saw the vote count go from something like 16 percent to 51 percent. Where did those votes come from? Were they early votes? Tell us more. Um, yes, yes. Almost all of what you're seeing right now is the early vote in mail-in from Nassau County. That was what was just posted. We had someone run out and tell us. We just put it up on the website. Unfortunately, I can't see the website, Jake, so I actually don't know what the numbers say. All I know is they just posted the early vote and the mail-in. So that is the batch you're looking at now. They already had that here. That was already largely in this building already. It's the election day vote that's been coming in and being processed now. So I imagine we should get some of that very shortly. Well, John, I'm happy to, to be your source of news and tell you uh, what the vote count is because you don't know. Uh, Tom Swazi uh, has 58.7% uh, of the vote. Uh, the Republican, Mozzie Pillip, has 41.3% of the vote. Uh, with 51% uh, of, of the vote in. Now, I hope John heard that. Yeah, I just wanted to locate John on the map. You're making fun of his scarf. I, I think it's a Red Sox scarf. I, I didn't. I wasn't making fun of it. I just yeah. said it was in yeah. a style homage to George Santos, <laughs> uh, who was a fashion icon unto himself. Um, so in any case... John Berman has been a fashion icon since before George Santos. I'm sorry. That's true. Weather that's, today, that's I'm true. appropriately dressed for the story. I, I agree, and you look lovely. Uh, so in any case, did you expect... Uh, 
this vote count at 51 percent? Because the polls, by the way, have been neck and neck within the margin of error throughout the entire special election. Obviously, we did not know who was actually going to turn out. It's so difficult to poll for who is going to turn out, who's a likely voter in a special election. And then, of course, there was a snowstorm that rolled through Nassau County this morning. Uh, and there were other things as well. There was, the, as you were talking in the interviews with the congressman and the congresswoman earlier, there was the idea that the Senate was maybe going to pass, uh, they might even do an immigration package. Then the Republicans, would, they couldn't reach a Republican agreement on that. Uh, and they, the, the Ukraine debate and the Israel debate and Donald Trump reemerging and, and, you know, whether it's his comments about NATO or anything else, but Donald Trump reemerging. So a number of things have happened that make an unpredictable special election even more unpredictable, I, I would argue, in the sense that Democrats started, started this election on defense on immigration. Absolutely. Late in the campaign on immigration, they tried, and these results will be one of the test cases. It's one race, one special election. We need to be careful to not say, wow, you know, we found gold here, uh, political gold here. But halfway through, the Democrats pivoted and tried to put the Republicans on defense, saying, wait a minute, we're trying to do something tough on the border. You've been asking us to do this for 25 years. We're trying to do it now, and you're the ones walking away. So we'll see what happens. This, uh, there are a lot of moving parts in this election, from the unpredictably turnout in the special election, from, you know, one candidate, very well known, one candidate, not quite as, you know, on the scene locally, but nowhere near the name identity of him, uh, all that money that uh, David Chalian was talking about earlier. So there are a lot of unpredictable ingredients in a special election. Uh, but if you're Tom Swazi and you're seeing you have the, it, it's the early vote, but this is Nassau County, this is where you're going to have the bulk of the vote yeah. come in from the district, and you get that. You get 59% in the first big installment. Again, you want to see some Election Day vote, but you're getting happy in the Swazi County. Yeah, and as you noted, it has not been exactly a banner week uh, for Republicans trying to make the argument that they can be trusted with control of government because there's been a lot of dysfunction among House Republicans. And who knows what effect that may have had in terms of suppressing the vote or even causing people to say, you know what, a, po yeah. a, a, po a pox and, on and that. And very quickly, sometimes being a former does not help you. Sometimes people want change. They don't want to go back. But one of his arguments in the end, we'll see if it works, is the Republicans are chaotic. They're a mess. You don't know what you're going to get. You want me there. You know me. You want me there to represent you. You want me on that wall. Now let's go to Lauren Fox at Republican Mozzie Phillips headquarters. She's in East Meadow, New York. Uh, Lauren, uh, these numbers are obviously disappointing uh, as of right now for Mozzie Phillips. We have no idea uh, where they're going to end up, but right now this is not where she wanted to be. Uh, 16,311 uh, 311 votes behind. Uh, what are you hearing uh, from Republicans about the race? Yeah, there are two men in this room for whom this race tonight is really important because they are up for re-election in November. I'm talking about Congressman Lolota, Congressman De Esposito. I just spoke with both of them about what this race, if Mozzie Pillip loses, could mean for them. And, you know, Lolota said and acknowledged the reality that this race tonight, even though it's a special election, even though it's February, even though there was a snowstorm, there are always lessons to be learned when you're looking for trend lines ahead of November and you're hoping to hold on to what is a swing district for yourself as well. Obviously, I talked to two voters today who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, turned around and voted for the Democrats in this race voted for Tom Suozzi because they said his message on bipartisanship and the fact that House Republicans have really struggled to pass legislation over the last couple of weeks impacted the way they were looking at this race. And if you're a Democrat running in these swing districts, running in a suburban district, that's the kind of message, that's the kind of playbook that you want to emulate in November. So obviously, both parties are going to be looking for lessons learned. Yes, it's a special election, but two Republicans in this room tonight are going to be waiting very closely to see what this result is finally because they're worried about what it could mean for them in November. All right, Lauren Fox at Pillow headquarters in New York. Thank you so much. And Anderson, as John and I were just discussing, uh, and anecdotally, uh, Lauren talked to two Republican or two Trump voters who went for Swazi. Uh, and one of the reasons, at least according to, to what Lauren just reported, was the fact that Republicans in recent days have not exactly been showing that they know how to govern. In fact, I think uh, this Congress is the least productive Congress uh, since the Great Depression, if memory serves. Anderson? Yeah, uh, definitely having an impact on voters. Uh, back with the team here in New York. David Chalian, I mean, if this does go for the Democrat, and we're expecting to hear from, uh, from Swazi uh, any moment, really, um, 
Does it send a message? I mean, there was a snowstorm. Republicans generally vote on Election Day. I mean, does one read too much into it or... Well, I definitely think there's danger of reading too much into it, but we'll do that nonetheless. But I, I, in the immediate term, in the immediate term, Anderson, if Swazi ends up victorious tonight, the math in the House changes. So uh, this is, this would be a flip from a Republican-held seat prior to the expulsion of Santos to a Democratic seat, and that's going to make Speaker Johnson's math that much more complicated. Like, for instance, if indeed that happens, there are still three vacancies. If everyone shows up for a vote, Johnson's only going to be able to lose two Republicans uh, on any given issue if he needs all the Republicans to vote for it instead of three. That's a big, that's a big deal. You, there's no margin for error. So that's one. But in terms of the, for the looking towards the fall, the thing about this district is this is New York. These New York districts are what delivered the majority to the Republicans in the House of Representatives. And it is precisely the kind of district that Democrats need to win back if they are to win control of the House of Representatives in November. And so, yes, there are specific circumstances here. I think the immigration issue is probably more acute here in the New York media market than it is in some of these other districts. The snow, no doubt about it. But the, the broad picture, the broad picture is if the Democrats can flip the seat back, they have a model to try and start recreating in some of these districts for but control I, I, of the House in the fall. I think to that point, look at what happened just a few hours ago. I mean, they impeached the Homeland Security Secretary by a single vote in mm. Washington. This would have potentially changed that mm -hmm. if, if Tom Swazi was Congressman Swazi when that vote went down. And so I can tell you, Speaker Mike Johnson's office is obviously watching this very closely. It was their number one priority today. This is not good news for them because it does have that immediate impact. Even if you can't really read into what's going to happen in November based on what's happening here tonight, Tonight. It has an immediate impact on what's going to happen over the and we should just point out, months. both candidates have said they will run again in November yep. in the right. regular election. I do think that there's one, one element of this race, and this is just one data point in several cycles where we've seen something similar, which is that these national trends of dissatisfaction in the electorate, Democratic-leaning voters are as unhappy as anybody else about what's happening at the border or the economy or what have you. But when people go into the voting booth and they make a decision about who they are going to vote for, it, it may not line up with how unhappy they are because it is a choice. And that is what national Democrats are counting on, the Biden campaign in particular, that people might be unhappy, but when you, they're facing A and B, they have to make a decision. And sometimes that does not line up necessarily with the trends here. This is a this is a district that should have been one where Republicans could have leveraged immigration, for example. If they don't pull out a win here, I do think it calls into question how potent that is going to be for voters when they are faced not just with the issue by pollsters, but with a choice in the ballot box. Let me tell you something about election mechanics that's bothering me as a Republican. Voting early, voting by mail, ballot harvesting, getting your votes in. It looks to me like the Democrats here crushed in the early voting in Nassau, mm -hmm. where the Republicans had to do well. And you're always just one snowstorm away from some kind of a turnout problem. And so the Democrats are going to win this. It looks like, we haven't called it yet, but it looks like, you know, they're, they're on their way. And a big part of it is the Republican Party remains resistant to getting votes in the bank. Gosh, who, who could have? Who could have possibly <laughs> it's crazy. given the Republicans the idea it's that it's not a good You've idea? You've got to vote. vote. I'm just, let me tell you. You've got to vote. Put, get your vote in. That's oh. all I'm saying. Vote whenever you can. Who, who, who could have given you such a stupid strategy? I'm just trying to <laughs> think to myself, is there someone who's just a perpetual loser, who loses over and over again, who also has a losing strategy when it comes to not voting early. Do you have, sir, <laughs> any <laughs> idea who might have we given We got it. We got it. <laughs> I, uh, it if I may, I mean, what I said at the outset was, you know, it's like two teams and who shows up on game day, right? And early voting is part of that process. And I think there's a, ten, uh, a tendency to overemphasize a congressional race as if, as if it's a national referendum all the time. And the reality is my experience has been people in, who live in Nassau County or Queens want to know, is this person going to do the best job for me mm. going forward? Uh, you can nationalize it all you want, but that's how they act. Now, I will say this, and what was telling um, that you can distinguish between the Siena poll that came out last week, uh, among independents in the district that President Biden won, are actually voting for Donald Trump. 
And head to head in that Siena poll, Donald Trump beats President Biden by six points. So I think you can distinguish well, between. But why'd you guys get beat? What's that? Why'd you get beat tonight? I don't know if it's well, over yet. Uh, <laughs> let's but, see what happens. You know, we'll, we'll see lie. what happens. But I think <laughs> when all is said and done, you know, Kathleen and I, you go to the voters, they entrust you because they want you to be their voice, their representative. Mm -hmm. And if Swazi wins, he deserves the win. It's and so hard every single day. Let's listen in to Mosey. Eight weeks. And we did a great job. We are the fighters. Yes, we lost, but it doesn't mean we're going to end here. I did. I did call my opponent. I congratulated him. And uh, I love you. You guys are great, amazing. I'm so proud to be part of this amazing organization, the Republican Party. Really, real leaders. And I want to thank Chairman Cairo for his hard work. Chairman! And I also would like to thank all my colleagues in government, the people who have been there with me every single day, and to you. Really, most important is to you. You guys are amazing. You are hard workers. You love this country. So let's keep it up, and we're going to continue to fight because we are not going to give up. We're going to bring common sense government. I promise you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> so we also are expecting to hear from uh, from uh, Tom Swazi. Uh, we'll obviously bring that to you live. Oh, we, we didn't hear from uh, from from uh, from you, Kathleen. We're well, look, I'm, I'm happy to hear this. I think that Tom was relentless on his messaging. He heard the voters. He understand what their concerns were, and I will say um, he was aided a lot with by a lot of financial help from Democrats in Washington. I think they understood how important it was to win this seat and go into November with a victory for how Democrats on Long Island. How much do you think Island. the fact that, I mean, people know him, uh, he has a long record there, uh, whereas uh, Pilly is less, less known? I think, I think it Pilly did matter. I mean, look, I've known Tom for almost as long as he's been in politics. Mm. People know him. You have Republicans and independents who are used to voting for him. Um, they've done it as county executive when he was mayor. And certainly now we know because independents had to majorly break his way in order for him to win tonight. And I think, again, just going back to the messaging, voters want to hear from people running for office who understand where how they are feeling. And even though Tom, you know, was speaking not a very progressive message <laughs> on Long Island, um, it was a message that worked because it resonated with voters. and. I think that kind of relentlessness was important. Look, look, our party is a broad party and it's a big tent. Yes. We, we don't all march down the same little road the way that Trump is marching his Republicans down the same road. And so you're going to have Democrats that can yes, punch absolutely. you out on There's immigration. It just us. happened tonight. I think, I think the familiarity of a de facto incumbent here may have mattered a lot because this district just tried something right. crazy, basically. And it blew up in, in the Which was the face. message that Swazi tried to push, which yeah. is like sh that, that she is is uh, Santos 2.0, yeah. which seems we, a little unfair. Yeah, we, we tried this thing that, that was sort of crazy. Let's well, just go back to... So What's crazy about About... So <laughs> <laughs> we tried something... Let's go back to something that we know was okay and not 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 out not, not, you know, not, you're, not, you're, not in the rough, still I, in the fair I, way. Happen, I happen to... If, if, if Victorious, I, I think that's the deciding factor. I think he's more seasoned as a as a candidate. That makes a, a difference. It, it came across. Uh, I think there's a familiarity, a reliability. Uh, they didn't want to take a chance. Mm -hmm. And he, he ran a good campaign. Also, was, you got to give the guy credit for he it. He was out there so much more than she was. She did yes. very few interviews or appearances. She only agreed to one debate. That was not until... Uh, the end of this. And so I think that was also part of it. But the other interesting thing that I, I'm curious about how the White House is watching it is he distanced himself from President Biden. He mm. disagreed with him on the border. President Biden didn't come campaign. Yeah, and she him. didn't embrace uh, Trump uh, Until either. The end. Uh, let's go back to Jake. Jake? All right, Anderson. And guess what? We can now make an important projection. CNN projects that the Democrat, Tom Suozzi, the former member of the House, will win the special election in New York's 3rd Congressional District. The Democrats are picking up the House seat previously held by ousted Republican George Santos. Suozzi defeating his Republican opponent, Mozzie Pillip, 
and now set to return to the House where he previously served. This is a big and critical victory for Democrats that shrinks the Republicans' already slim majority in the House. Uh, with Swazi's win, Democrats will have 213 House seats compared to 219 for Republicans with three seats as of right now uh, remaining uh, vacant. So it's a huge victory uh, for Democrats. And let us go now and check in with our friend Miguel Marquez, who is at campaign headquarters uh, where Swazi is. I believe he's in Glen Cove in New York. Uh, and Miguel, the TV hasn't caught up with where we are, but I see they're watching CNN. Uh, they got to be feeling good there. They are feeling incredibly confident here. And the magic of TV, you're about to see. In fact, I'm going to let you listen to this right now. So we're about a minute, minute and a half delayed or from when you guys speak to when it hits the TVs here. So that is the news. Look at that sea of cell phones taking all this in. We expect Tom Suozzi now to hit he and Jay Jacobs, the head of the Democratic Party here in New York State, to take the stage in about 15 minutes, which is about 10:30, uh, and and he will, you know, he will declare victory in this race. He ran such a a, a focused and uh, intense race. It was a very very short election of less than two months, and he just. Use his name, you know, his, 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 not just him, but his father, his uncle, the Swazi name is known throughout Long Island. He's a longtime sort of centrist Democrat. He hasn't always gotten along with the party itself, and that worked in his favor. He ran essentially on Republican issues, on the, on immigration, on, on the, on the border, uh, on crime and on taxes, and really drove that, uh, that message home. The other thing that really worked for him was that sort of ghost of George Santos, though. Despite the fact that many voters didn't want to talk about George Santos, what drove them to the polls in the final days is that they were doing early voting was that anger, that residual anger over George Santos. And we've seen this with, with candidates or, or with members of Congress that leave uh, under, under bad circumstances and then their party gets punished in the next election. And that seems to have played out here tonight. We expect to see... Uh, what we expected to say is Congressman-elect uh, uh, Tom Suozzi in about five minutes. Jake? All right. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, then, uh, Miguel, uh, for Congressman-elect uh, Suozzi. Uh, and Dana uh, uh, Mazi has already conceded uh, defeat uh, to the Democrat. Which these days uh, we should, I guess, not necessarily take for granted. It, it is important that we are seeing a democracy work the way it, it is supposed to there. And, Manu, you were up in this district a couple of weeks ago. I was up uh, this past week. It really is um, interesting to see somebody like Tom Suozzi, who is as classic a politician as they come. I mean, he came up through, not only did he have a, a father and grandfather who were involved in politics, but he came up through uh, local politics, being a mayor, being a county executive. And to watch him, I watched him work the phones and, uh, you know, stay in touch with people asking what people's names were who they met on the street because maybe he knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. It's, it was that kind of connection that he continues to have. Really, I think you, you can't buy that. That yeah. makes such a huge difference. And he had significant name ID, which, which yes. is key, too. And, I'm, you know, it was remarkable, though. There was a real fear among Democrats that they were going to blow this race despite having those built-in advantages, despite uh, this fact that the Joe Biden did carry this district in 2020. This is a low turnout election. Their voter anger was real over immigration. Swazi recognizes he was getting nailed on the issue of immigration, had to cut two ads to defend himself. There was a dispute within the Democratic Party about how exactly to go over Mazi Pillup, a debate between national Democrats, Swazi allies, and the like. And there was a fear that this was all going to slip away. And the decision by Swazi to essentially distance himself from the National Democratic Party brand. And it also, Joe Biden. I asked him, would you campaign with Joe Biden? He said Joe Biden would not be helpful 
in this district. And at the end, Mozzie Pillip, yes, she didn't say if she would vote for Donald Trump and the like. She ultimately did say she, she did. And she defended Trump over all of his criminal charges and the like when I talked to her. And she leaned in pretty hard to the Republican Party brand. The national Democrat Republicans came out, local Republicans came out, and she thought that would help her at the end of the day, and it just did not. And, Jeff, the question is, looking at the way that Swazi ran this campaign as a person who is a candidate in and of himself, somebody, again, who has those ties, not connected to Joe Biden as much as he possibly can, despite Republicans really trying hard to, to uh, attach the two of them. What kind of lessons do we think that Democrats who are going to be on the ballot with Joe Biden in November are going to take from the way that he uh, ran that campaign? I think first and foremost, it's a warning sign talking to Democrats that they know by now immigration is going to be a central issue regardless of where you live. You do not need to be in a border uh, state or district, it is everywhere. Because Thank of you, what, Governor Abbott. What Texas Governor Greg Abbott did, it was a very remarkable thing. So that is one thing. Immigration is a huge concern, which they know. What they also know is these are local elections, and if you have a strong campaign and brand, you can either outrun or distance yourself from the president to a point. But this is a special election with a very low turnout. So I think any lessons that we draw tonight are probably short-term lessons. Mm -hmm. For Democrats, no doubt, it is a... A sign of relief. It is a welcome sign for them. But I think in terms of the fall, there was no primary in this case. There will be primaries in the fall. Mm -hmm. So there are many, many, many differences. But uh, Democrats can outstand uh, the Biden uh, low approval rating. Adi? I think uh, Swazi is speaking now. But um, very briefly, this is a race. Oh, okay, sorry about that. This is a it's race a that did trend. not have um, abortion hanging over it, right? So you can't sort of goose or animate the electorate with that. It's also a race where Republicans had their kind of fantasy atmosphere of immigration and crime being issues that people are talking about a lot, and he found a way to talk about them. Uh, the Israel issue is kind of a wash because essentially he was saying you can have no conditions and still funding. And so some of these positions don't work on the national level, um, but I think that it's going to be instructive in some ways for people who are trying to win over suburbs who are Democrats, who are saying, how do you do this if you can't lean on abortion rights as the issue to get you over? Yeah. And I, I wonder also the immigration issue, the fact that the Senate did cut that bipartisan border deal. That gave that Swazi something to talk about. He sure. went after Republicans for abandoning that. And he said that he had pushed Joe Biden to essentially come out with a bipartisan deal, own the issue, go after Republicans. So we'll see if that actually made a difference among yeah. uh, voters. Here. Yeah, you know, and, and that really made um, people think not just about the issue of immigration, but the way Washington is running and the chaos. Yeah. I, I'm thinking of a guy by the name of Vic who I met in Beth Page, and he said, I just want somebody who's normal, who won't stoke <laughs> the chaos. This he is said, probably the he person said normal, not normal. Who could but. ever make the Problem Solvers Caucus sound sexy. Like prior to this <laughs> point, that's not been useful. All right, here he is, uh, Congressman elect Tom Swazi. Let's, uh, let's listen in as he uh, declares victory. I am. Go back, go back, go back. Everybody back. Hey, anything else? Signs down. Thank God. Let me just enjoy this for one more minute, okay?
Okay, all right. Despite all the attacks, despite all, all the lies about Tom Swazi and the squad, <laughs> about Tom Swazi being the godfather of the migrant crisis, yeah. about Sanctuary Swazi, despite the dirty tricks, despite the vaunted Nassau County Republican machine. We won. Now, we know that this race was fought in a district with a This race was fought amidst a closely divided electorate, much, li much like our whole country. This race was centered on immigration and the economy, much like the issues all across our country. We won this race. We, you, won this race. Because we addressed the issues and we found a way to bind our divisions. You know, what we just saw with the protest tonight, okay? There are divisions in our country where people can't even talk to each other. All they can do is yell and scream at each other. And that's not the answer to the problems we face in our country. The answer is to try and bring people of goodwill together to try and find that common ground. Yes. We, won this, we won this campaign because the people of Queens and Long Island Let's hear it for Queens. Let's hear it for Long Island. 80-20. It's an 80-20 district. Let's hear it for Labor. Let's hear it for Labor. But the people of Long Island and Queens are sick and tired of the political bickering. They've had it. They want us to come together and solve problems. So now, we have to carry the message of this campaign to the United States Congress and across our entire country. It's time, it's time to move beyond the petty partisan bickering and the finger pointing. It's time to focus on how to solve the problems. Yes. It's time to get to work on immigration, yes. on Israel, yes. on con combating Putin, yes. on helping the middle class, yes. and on getting the state and local tax deduction back. Yes. Let's send a message to our friends running the Congress these days. Stop running around for Trump. Start running the country. Yeah. It's time to find common ground and start delivering for the people of the United States of America. The people are watching. They want us to start working together. So our message is very clear. Either get on board or get out of the way. <laughs> to the people in this room and to our friends throughout this whole campaign, thank you so much for sticking with me. We've all seen, we've all seen what politics has become. And in this campaign, we try to give a vision of what it could be. Respect. Let's take our country back 
from the dividers. You know that no external force is ever going to beat the United States of America. The only way we're going to be in trouble is if we let ourselves continue to be divided from within. So this whole campaign, the whole campaign has been about how do we communicate to people that we can be better if we work together to try and solve the problems we face in our country. And that's the message. That's the message that resonated with the people in this campaign. This was a really tough campaign. And we only won because of that message and because of all of you. Yeah. So listen, do you want to take the country back from the people who are trying to divide it? Yes. Are you with me in that fight? Yes. Are we going to keep on working until we hold politicians accountable when they just try to use issues for weaponization to try and destroy the other guys instead of actually solving the problems to make people's lives better. That's what we've got to do in this country. I've got to thank a whole bunch of people. I'm never going to be able to thank everybody by name, Anthony. <laughs> so let me just be very clear, okay? I want to start by thanking the chairman of the Nassau County Democratic Party, Jay Jacobs and the Nassau County Democratic Party. I want to thank the chairman of the Queens Republican Party, Green, Greg Meeks. And the, did I say Republican? I don't, want to thank, I don't want to thank the chairman of the Queens Republican Party. I want to thank the chairman of the Queens Democratic Party, Greg Meeks, and the Queens Democratic Party for selecting me as the candidate to run in this race. I am so grateful for this honor. I want to say this is the best campaign I've ever been involved with in my entire life. It's been amazing. I've got to thank my best friend, the best partner anybody could ever have in their life, who's put up with so much. <laughs> Let's hear it for Helene Swazi. <laughs> and our daughter, Caroline, who worked so much on the campaign. <laughs> Michael and Joseph. I gotta thank our awesome campaign staff. Unbelievable. led by John Gonin, our campaign manager, my advisor for the past 23 years, Kim Devlin, and the great Nick Ryan. So I can't go through everybody on the team. You're all fantastic. You're all awesome. I've got to th thank the pe people on whose backs really carried a large part of this campaign my friends, the men and women of labor. Yeah. I will always have your back the way you had my back. I am so grateful to all of you. I can't believe how much work everybody did from the very beginning to the very end of this campaign up until just a few hours so that's ago. That's Tom Swazi, so uh, who has now won uh, this uh, special election. It'll be obviously another election uh, for this same seat uh, in, in November. Both candidates had pledged to, to, uh, to run again. I'm not sure if... Do you think the Republican candidate will? Philip will, can, will run again? I mean, that's going to be up to the party leadership. Um, I think they'll probably take a deeper look on where the numbers came from, how they did. But... Uh, I mean, she has said that she was going to run, whether she won or lost, but we'll see. If, if, she, if she had pulled it off, we'd be sitting here talking about how she yeah. was from, from central casting, a woman of color, a former soldier, Israeli, the new face of the Republican Party. So, I mean, there was a reason that she seemed plausible to people. Mm -hmm. She just got whooped now if they want to find somebody else. But Look, it's there, going to be redi there's redistricting yeah. in this, which will make it tougher for the Republicans, tougher for the Republicans in this district. Yeah. But I think one really important moment is what we just saw there when he got on stage, Tom Swazi, to give this acceptance speech. And before he even spoke to the crowd gathered there, a protester protesting the, Israel, the U.S.'s stance toward Israel right now and a, a believed pro-Palestinian protester 
got up there, which is something that is happening at basically every single event that you see so many Democrats, mainly President Biden and Vice President Harris, going to right now. It was a key issue in this race. Obviously, you mentioned that she was a former soldier, a former soldier in the IDF. And, and Tom Swazi was someone who, he made this argument that I thought was really interesting, which was that you don't need any more pro-Israel Republicans in Congress. You need a pro-Israel Democrat in Congress, in Washington, which I thought was something that, you know, clearly was a, a big part for voters here, given there are a lot of Jewish people who live in this district. One of the biggest districts in the country for a Jewish population. Mm -hmm. And so you had, you had both candidates here uh, speaking to that group. But I do think it foreshadows, Van, you and I were talking about this earlier, what is going to happen to Joe Biden at this Democratic convention later this year on that topic? You're going to have a lot of energy still around that. One thing on Swazi's uh, speech, by the way, you know, he ran as a very, very moderate guy, moderate Democrat, I mean, even running on one tax cut for the rich, running on pro-ICE, border enforcement. I mean, this does not sound like, you know, your standard issue, liberal, progressive. Now, you would say, well, he's running to match his district. But it is interesting to me that that message obviously sold here, but it is decidedly not where the energy is in the Democratic Party, but he, you know, he found a, he found a way that works. I, I actually like what he had to say. I mean, I, I find it's, some people love the war of politics. I think most people just want their elected officials to find solutions to their mm -hmm. problems. Better schools, better parks, better transit options. I represent Staten Island. That's not too dissimilar from, from this congressional district. That's what people want at the end of the day, I believe. Yeah, there's going to be people on either side who are like, just throw a grenade into their tent and when we're happy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't, I don't subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. So I give him credit for... But basically, get up there and say, you've elected me to find solutions to your problems, and I think that's the right approach. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, look, I, I think a couple things. Uh, this is going to be rerun. Um, to your point, there's going to be a different district, so I think this guy's going to be here for a while. But I think that this idea that all Democrats are these far-left progressives that are, you know, all socialists and all what, that's not our party. Uh, we've got base black voters that are quite conservative on a bunch of issues. We have a big tent party. And people get attention in our party who are on the extremes, but we got a big tent. The problem, I think, on the Republican side is they're being forced by one guy to tow one line on everything. And that now Republicans can't even deliver on immigration because one guy, Donald Trump, doesn't want them to. So I think the flexibility in our party, that, we can, that you can have Democrats excited to see AOC on our air tonight and also excited this guy won, that's a healthy party. We have a healthy party. It's interesting, though, the discussion, you think about, I don't know, was it last week, you had the president come out, give that press conference in response to the Heard uh, uh, report, um, didn't go over well among <laughs> certainly the, the pundit class. Um, and then... There was a lot of hand-wringing among Democrats about President Biden. And then President Trump came out with the comments about NATO and, and encouraging Russia to invade countries and in, uh, NATO countries that don't, uh, you know, pay their, their fair share. Um, and I'm wondering if this victory by a Democrat, you know, whatever the, 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 the reasons for in the particular district, but does this... Does this sort of give some wind to, to the sails for Democrats? So I think that one of the things you're pointing to is, and this is what Van was saying as well, which party leader, if it's Trump or Biden, is going to allow the candidates down ballot to break away from them, mm. to have some space from the national narrative? That's how districts are won. That's how Senate races are won. That's how in tough election cycles like this, one that we're about to have, where the, the national mood is so sour. The party that is going to be victorious is going to be the one where the candidates who are the right for those those ge geographies are able to break away from the national narrative and run the right race for that 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 place. In this case, I think that is what you saw happen here for for Swazi. He was able to create an identity for himself that was separate and apart from Joe Biden. He had to do it somewhat aggressively, but that's what you're going to see a lot of candidates doing. They're doing a low turnout months. special, by yeah, the way. Exactly. It's harder to do when the president is on the ballot and, and his opponent is on the ballot. Which so, means what a Mike Lawler and the yeah. other freshman Republican moderates who right now, you know, could have hoped that that, that immigration bill that was bipartisan could have potentially helped them. Uh, but what do they do? Come, what does this mean for them tonight? I think those are several, three people, I believe, that you're watching really closely to see 
what they're reading in this because they are people who did not run similar to Trump. You know, they said the election was not rigged. They said it was not stolen. They've broken with their party on the more extreme parts of it. But how do they look at tonight and how does that change their race come November? What we didn't hear from Tom Swasey tonight was uh, going after Trump or trying to paint uh, the entire Republican Party uh, with Donald Trump tonight. That That's going to change. That is what Joe Biden is going to do. That is their campaign. Because to your big 10-point van, the unifying force for Democrats, for everyone in that tent, is Donald Trump. Yes. And that's what the Biden team is, is banking on here. And that's what's going to change in the environment apart from this special election, as Scott was saying, to a much more nationalized... We're going to be in such a, a Trump-Biden dynamic that that tends... It, it tends to have down-ballot impact in the heat of a presidential look, election. Congressional this Republicans... Flexibility, just one, we're struggling with this right now as Republicans. We've got... Take the Senate races. we got everybody from Kerry to Larry. Kerry Lake to Larry Hogan. Couldn't be... But you've got Republicans out there who couldn't be angrier about Larry Hogan getting into the Maryland Senate race. Now, he's the exact right kind of Republican for that race. But I see people every day saying, we can't possibly elect this kind of a Republican. But that's the person you would need there. So that that flexibility point is a good one. And, you know, for the party leaders, they don't really need a litmus test on what kind of a person you are. You just need to get there and give your party the majority the, the smart party will go that direction. I'm a little worried about the Republicans not embracing people like a Hogan uh, in that Maryland Senate race because they just, you know, they want more purity and not not as much majority. Yeah, Abby? That's Republican. If I could just say yeah. to your point, Abby, look, I've, I've been in this Democratic majority where we have been given the flexibility from leadership, congressional leadership, to do whatever you have to do to win. Say whatever you have to say. If you want Biden to come to your district, he'll be there. If you don't, he won't. That is not going to happen for Mike Lawler or anyone on Long Island. It's just not going to happen. Abby? But in fairness, yeah. I think, you know, this is one race. As you said, Tom Swazi deserves a good victory. He apparently ran a very good campaign. But this is against the backdrop of the trend over the last few years across Long Island and indeed some parts of New York State where the Republican Party has done very well because... I don't know every race, but they probably had good candidates running on issues that matter. And I want to talk before about the, the ad spending. More than 80% of the ads spent were on immigration, migrant issues, and law enforcement. Because there's a, a feel, at least around New York City and the suburbs, Staten Island, Long Island, the, the Westchester, that there's something that's just wrong. And nobody's doing anything about it. So we're going to hire the people to, who's going to fix that. And I think Swazi pulled a good one. He said, I'm gonna, I know the immigration's a problem, and I'm going to be your guy to fix it. Mm. And that probably helped him when, when all was said and done. But one of the other elements I, I think that Swazi's alluding to, and um, I think we heard from uh, some of our reporters talking to voters, saying they look at Washington... Mm. And they look and see what kind of leadership is on display. Republicans in the House are not doing themselves any favors by making this an incredibly unproductive uh, legislative session by not being able to govern even with their own small majority, which Democrats have had and have been able to pass laws. That doesn't help when voters are trying to decide who actually what is the model for leadership that I want to support in Washington, that is going to be a problem. Not, I think it was a problem in this race. It's probably going to be a problem in a lot of other races going down the line. This was their supposed to be their opportunity to show voters how they would lead. And so far, frankly, it's been kind of a disaster from day one when they could not elect a speaker. And Biden's going to tie that dysfunction to Donald Trump. Yeah. And, and, and that, what and they're that, doing tonight is impeaching the Homeland Security Secretary after they just sunk the bipartisan immigration and, bill that was for negotiated. For, 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 I mean, not, not just, on not just what, are they not, what are they impeaching him for, but the impeachment is not going to go anywhere. So it's like, what are, what are they doing? What are they doing? Least, there are two different kinds of disorder and dysfunction. Um, I think the Republicans have been trying to look at the disorder and dysfunction at the street level and talk about crime and talk about immigration, tie the two together and talk about that. The problem is, in power, they look like the disorder and the dysfunction. What they're doing in D.C. every day looks disordered and dysfunctional. And so I think Democrats are going to start pointing that out. And because... They ginned up the issue of immigration. Republicans took... Nobody was talking about immigration this time last year. It was all abortion. Republicans successfully took that issue from the margin to the center, dropped the ball, and then lost an election on it. That's where the, that Republican Party is. Well, I, but, but it, Dropped the ball, didn't pass legislation, and then lost an election. But, it, but the Democrat did run 
a pro-enforcement campaign. Sure. I mean, he was running clips yeah. of himself on Fox News supporting We can beat you ICE. on that issue, but you guys so, can't pass legislation. That's what I'm but, saying. But I'm saying not every Democrat's going <laughs> to mm -hmm. be able to run let's, as hard on immigration. Let's as go back to Jake in D.C. Jake? Thanks, Anderson. Uh, let's uh, talk about all of this uh, with the panel. And I guess there is this question about how much of the Republican dysfunction that we've seen on Capitol Hill uh, played a, a role. Anecdotally, we've heard from some voters or, or uh, Lauren Fox from, from some voters that that played a role. But then there's also just the Trump factor. How much did Donald Trump and his presence uh, play a role in what happened to a, a woman who, you know, a local official who otherwise uh, might have uh, been a very strong candidate. I'm not sure that in this particular case uh, it played a big role. I mean, you were also there. I'd love to know what you think. Uh, certainly what Democrats tried to do was tie her to, uh, to Trump. In fact, there was a bit of a, of a kerfuffle between uh, the party and, his, and Tom Suozzi's campaign because the party, which is uh, the independent expenditure side, the people who put up ads and they're not supposed to coordinate with the campaign or the party, uh, called her a MAGA Republican. And at first, Tom Suozzi and his campaign, they were not that happy about that because they really wanted to um, not scare off the MAGA Republicans. Right. Yeah, because they thought some of them would actually vote for him. So it, it wasn't as big of a factor because she wouldn't really talk about Donald Trump as much as other Republicans are eager to because of where she was. Yeah, no question about it. And yeah, that was that was an interesting dynamic because they were worried about giving her credence with the MAGA base, exactly. maybe juicing the MAGA turnout because they try they didn't really know who she was and trying to define her as someone who is hiding from her views. That's how Swazi wanted to label her. But it was just the way that Swazi was able to manage the the toxicity and that he would frankly acknowledge that the toxicity of the Democratic brand and try to pivot around that. That will be a learning uh, something that. A playbook that will be replicated by Democrats in these swing districts time and again, and to take on issues like immigration head on. I mean, the 20, this reminds me of the 2020 uh, elections in which we're. Democrats lost in a lot of these key races because they did not take on the issue of crime. They got hit on the issues of defunding the police. Swazi recognized he was getting absolutely eviscerated on immigration and tried to take it head on. And he probably was helped by that Senate bipartisan deal that was cut, could seize on that, could put, take it to Mozzie Pelp and say, Republicans killed this one good chance we have to do something. And also not to explain things away, like on the issue of immigration and particularly crime, his approach was not to say, well, the numbers aren't as bad as you think, because if you look at these <laughs> stats, which you often right. hear from Democrats, he said, look, I get it. I get that you think this is a problem. I think it's a problem. But look at how the Republicans didn't handle it. So instead of just sort of saying, like, well, it's in your head, it's not as bad as you think, he really just addressed it. And the bottom line to all of this is Donald Trump and uh, President Biden were largely bystanders. They won't be in a general election. They will be at the middle of all this. But what Democrats are sort of relying on now is they can use money and they have financial advantage in many respects to push back in this case. But I think this, again, for as, as interesting as it is, it has very limited lessons, perhaps, for the election nine months from now. All right, Democrat Tom Suozzi is headed back to Congress. CNN projecting that he will defeat Republican Mozzie Pillup in the race to replace ousted Congressman George Santos. A big blow for House Republican leadership dealing with an already razor-thin GOP majority. Our coverage continues in just a moment. Back after this. Major victory for Democrats this evening. Tom Suozzi winning the special House election in New York, picking up the seat previously held by the expelled Republican fabulist George Santos, and eroding the Republicans' already razor thin majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. Suozzi, a former congressman, now congressman elect, defeating Republican Mozzie Pillip in New York's third congressional district in the long island area let's take a look at the status of votes right now with 87 percent of the vote in swazi still has a commanding lead with 54.2 percent of the vote 83,405 votes that's 12,990 votes ahead of republican mazi pillip who has 45.8 percent of the vote this is something of a shellacking in a district 
that had polled pretty much neck and neck uh, throughout the race. And this is why this House race matters so much. With Swazi's win, the Democrats win, Democrats will now have 213 House seats compared to 219 with Republicans, with three seats still remaining vacant right now. So that means Republicans now face an even tougher path to push through legislation as the 2024 election year unfolds. With that six feet, six vote majority, they can only afford to lose three Republican votes in any one vote. Let's go to Miguel Marquez, who is at Swazi campaign headquarters in Woodbury, uh, New York. And, and, and Miguel, a huge win for Swazi and Democrats this evening. Enormous and, and early as well. You know, there was growing confidence when they saw the early votes come in, the absentees, and they kind of felt that they had some momentum going. Uh, but the Republican machine here in Nassau County is renowned. They can get the vote out. But that snowstorm hit, that may have helped Democrats as well. And I, I think that they expected to have a decent night tonight. I do not think that they expected to call it this early. You know, uh, Swazi uh, talking up there today uh, just a short time ago saying that this will send a signal to to Democrats everywhere about how they have to win uh, and what they need to do to win in November. And for Republicans in purple districts, they better pay attention because they are coming from that for them. It, is, it was a very, very sort of strong statement about what worked in this specific race. There were a couple of protesters who tried to break in, but there were shouts of, of Swazi, Swazi as soon as they did, and they moved them out. Uh, they also, to be fair, they also had a mic issue, so he was buying time up there uh, so that people could place their mics up on the, uh, the lectern because the, the, the system they have here did not work. But, you know, he's even the protesters that showed what a pro he is in campaigning. He basically just said, I love America. He wants people to be able to speak. He's, he's very, very quick. He's, he ran a very, very aggressive campaign uh, and, and never wasted a minute. Uh, his entire campaign staff was completely on it every single day. That's something we did not see out of the Republican side. So it was interesting to see these two campaigns uh, uh, next to each other. Jake. All right, Miguel Marquez at Swazi headquarters in New York. Uh, let's uh, check in now uh, with the White House because President Biden uh, just put out a statement about his party's win in New York. Uh, and with that story, let's go to CNN's MJ Lee, who's at the White House. Uh, MJ, what does President Biden have to say this evening? Yeah, this is actually a new statement that we've just gotten from the Biden campaign uh, manager. It doesn't actually mention Tom Swazi by name, interestingly. Uh, but in terms of what the message is, it couldn't be more explicit. It starts with the words, Donald Trump lost again tonight. Uh, it goes on to say when Republicans run on Trump's uh, extreme agenda, even in a Republican-held seat, voters reject them. It also says Trump and the MAGA extremists in the House are already paying the political price for derailing a bipartisan deal to secure our borders and fix our broken immigration system. Uh, obviously, as you've been talking about all night, immigration and the border has been such a big issue in this race. And when I was talking to a Biden campaign official earlier, they pointed out that Swazi actually didn't even get a chance to run ads on Republicans walking away from that border deal. And they feel like uh, this is a good sign for Democrats, that this issue and this criticism uh, has really resonated. I think also, Jake, in the Swazi campaign, we saw a model for how uh, Democrats are having to sort of navigate the political reality that they have a very unpopular uh, leader of the party. That's President Biden, of course. Uh, we saw Swazi really keeping uh, his distance from President Biden uh, in his victory speech earlier tonight, didn't even mention uh, the president. So that is a balancing act that we are continuing to see uh, Democrats having to juggle uh, throughout the country. All right, MG Lee at the White House for us. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, however unpopular uh, Joe Biden might prove, uh, it is obviously a good day for Biden and for Democrats and a bad one uh, for Trump and Republicans. It is. This was, before George Santos was expelled, just if you just start with one, that was red. 
uh, and tonight it is blue, and Tom Swasey will be the congressman again from the district. There we are, we're up to about 87%. So look at, Just look at that, though. Yeah. I did right. not expect that. That's right. a shellacking. Right. That, that is a shellacking, and it could be that a bit of the margin, let's give a bit of the margin maybe to the weather, but let's also not give the Republicans the excuse of the weather. Democrats voted too. Yes, they may have voted early. Scott Jennings made a great point earlier. Republicans maybe want to start putting <laughs> votes in the bank. Uh, it might help, but, but look, you vote early or you vote on election day. Those are the rules, them the rules, and... He won. Okay, he won. Uh, and he but, won. Okay, but can yeah. I just interrupt yeah. one second? Yeah. Uh, to, to my point, and yeah. you're also making this point, but more subtly, yeah. which is, and Van made it earlier, Van Jones made it, who is the genius that told Republicans that they shouldn't vote early? Right. Donald right. Trump. Yeah, they're trying in to... In 2020. I mean, that's... Republicans should be voting early. Everybody should be voting early. I mean, who cares? Both parties should want every eligible voter to vote. Sure. And, and make it as easy as possible for every eligible voter to vote. So, so if that's their strategy yes. and, they got, and then they got hamstrung by the bad weather, that also is Donald Trump's fault. Anyway, I interrupted. That's okay. Uh, Tom Swazi is winning, and he's winning convincingly. He's almost 13,000 votes ahead right now, and you're right. In the special election for what was a Republican seat, uh, the margin is surprising. So how does he do it? Uh, number one, in the smaller piece of the district, but critical for the Democrats, Queens, the actual part that is New York City, he runs it up pretty good, right? 62%. Look at about 6,000 vote margin there, right? If you come, that, come for that, a little less than that, but 6,000 votes. That's in the Democrat. You heard him thank Labor tonight. Very important in this part of the district right here. Uh, helping turn out votes. A lot of that done again. Organized labor has a very good early voting program. Uh, and you come in here. Now Nassau County, this is the wow. part that will be studied. Again, yeah. it's one special election. One special election. So you don't project everything through November. However, this will be closely studied. Was it just Tom Swazi who's a no name? Was it how he handled immigration? Was it how he handled you know, Israel? Was it how he handled the economy? Uh, that'll all be studied now because in the suburban part of the district uh, that George Santos won when he won the seat in 2022, he's getting 53% of the vote and we're but right? Maybe that margin closes a little bit, but 8,000 votes there, right? Remember I said a little shy of 8,000 votes there. So he, he did what he had to do in the Democratic area but he also won in the more suburban area here, the more affluent, the more highly educated part of the district. That will be the part that is studied now because this seat now turns blue, right? So we, let's come back out. Let's come back out to the big map. and Let's come to where the house is right now. Again, that was red when George Santos had it, right? Uh, you had this gentleman in the house tonight, uh, Mr. Lawler. He's going to be worried about this, right? Because this is the district Joe Biden carried. He's going to say, okay, what just happened there? Because that used to be a Democratic district as well. I, I mentioned him because he was in the House tonight, but let's come out to the full map and just show you some districts here. So again, this might get overdone by people, but that was 18 mm -hmm. this morning, right? House districts held by Republicans that Joe Biden carried. That was 18 this morning. When you're trying to figure out what did we learn tonight, this is where Democrats are going to start. Uh, they're going to start in the districts that Joe Biden carried. Most of these districts, not all, are somewhat similar to this, meaning they're suburban. They tend to be more higher educated, more, more affluent than the national averages. So the Democrats are going to look at these, saying if we want to win back the House majority, there's your building blocks. doesn't mean because Swazi won that the Democrats win these seats, but that's what we're going to set. So this is the challenge as you look ahead to November. Yeah. And we get good candidates like Swazi to run in these races, right? And so here, but here, to me, is the most important thing tomorrow or next week when Swazi comes down and gets sworn in. Uh, remember, the House Republicans impeached the Homeland Security Secretary today by one vote, right? Their majority has now shrunk. It's only by one vote, but in a very narrow majority, Abby was making the point earlier, Nancy Pelosi had a narrow majority. She was able to get quite a bit done. Uh, a succession, Kevin McCarthy, now Speaker Johnson, have a narrow majority. They haven't done all that much. Guess what? It's about to be smaller. So I remember when Nancy Pelosi first got elected uh, Speaker of the House in, I think, 2006, right, during the Bush years. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons she was able to win the House back from the Republicans is a bunch of moderate to conservative Democrats that she called the majority makers. You heard AOC earlier tonight talk about how there need to be people who disagree uh, within the Democratic Party so that they can get the majority. She said that's, I said, you know, what about a guy like Swazi who doesn't even want Biden to campaign? She's like, the most important thing is that we get the majority. So here's my question. Swazi was obviously given some rope to be, you know, to give some, some leeway, to be independent, to badmouth Biden, to, to distance himself from other Democrats. Are Republicans who are the majority makers for the majority right now, are they able to do that? Are Congressman Lawler, are the uh, Lalota and other Republicans who represent Biden districts, 
Are they allowed to be independent or are they forced to stay in line so that Donald Trump doesn't start attacking them? You just answered your question. I did. Yes. Yeah, will, would Speaker Johnson have the smarts to go into a room and say, I understand, Mike Lawler, you're not from Louisiana like me. You have to run a different campaign. You might even have to say, I disagree with the Speaker. Speaker Johnson is smart enough to say, do it. Do what you need to do to win. Kevin McCarthy was smart enough to say, for all the criticism of Kevin McCarthy, they weren't terribly great at the governing part. Um, but in terms of the political part, however, you answered your own question. Donald Trump won't give them the right way. And so, Donald Trump, so you're going to have to, you know, does Mozzie Pillip run again? Does, do the, does the Nassau County Republican Party think we need somebody else in November? They, they picked her to run this. There will be primaries in all these places. There will be primaries here. And Trump is on a path, barring some huge thing in South Carolina a week from Saturday, uh, to be the Republican nominee. And he just simply does not play that way. Yeah. And, and, and Dana Bash, when Congressman Mike Gallagher, who is, you know, out of t uh, Hollywood typecasting for a Republican congressman, military hero, good looking guy, smart. He chairs the select committee uh, on the Chinese Co uh, Communist Party. When he showed some independ independence last week and said, hey, I don't think there's any reason to vote to impeach the Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, Mayorkas, um, it was a rough week for him. And then that week ended with him announcing he's not going to run for reelection. So I think there is something to be discussed here when it comes to how much Republicans are able to keep a majority if they don't allow people to be independent. There's a ton of them. There's a ton of them retiring. Yeah. A, a, including Mike Pence's brother, who just say, I've had enough. Kathy McMorris Rogers is, a, is no. another one. Dana? Yeah. yeah, let's uh, keep talking about that. And more specifically here in Washington, what the already narrow House Republican majority is going to look like. Because... You know, we talk about all of these issues, immigration, and about whether or not Republicans uh, can act in the best interest of their district or if they have to toe the party slash Trump line. But what it all comes down to, and I've been getting texts from Republican strategists who are very worried, is the, the notion of just chaos and the inability to govern, and that that really had an impact uh, on what we saw in the special election. And remember, we're only eight months away from the real election. The, these races are all going to, this race is going to be run again, or at least there will be a race run in this district, and then all of the other House races. I mean, another way to think of it is a shift in values. If you're focused on legislating, it's disorder. If you're focused on messaging, hey, maybe it's pretty good. And one of the things that we were shown <laughs> with the debate over the speaker is that there could be a small faction of people who only care about the commercials messaging being in the media ecosystem, and they can kind of spoil it for everyone else. So will there be some, will, will the next race sort of pull people in a direction of saying, look, we actually have to pass something if we're going to convince people that we should be in charge? Or is it just still so valuable to large parts of the party who are following Trump to just do the messaging part of it, play the part, do those performances, um, and don't worry too much about whether or not something passes because you don't want to hand a victory to Biden anyway. And it's not even just accomplishments. It's even just passing a messaging agenda, which mm -hmm. Republicans have had a very difficult time doing. And it's easy to forget that the whole ouster of Kevin McCarthy happened in this Congress. It happened only a few months ago, and that led to so much back and forth in disarray and the inability of this Republican majority simply to pass messaging bills week in, week off to try to push and argue that they did this on this issue and that issue and another issue. They were able to do some of that at the beginning of the Congress, but things started to become much more complicated after they raised the national debt limit. That caused a lot of finger pointing and bad blood. Even then the there was to keep the government open mess, just basically. for a couple of weeks and the punting that the kicking the can down the road for that but this one vote will be so significant one vote tonight would have stopped the Mayorkas impeachment and there could be a Biden impeachment coming sometime how will these swing district Republicans vote on Joe Biden's impeachment if it does come to that that's going to be a big question one less vote will make it harder you to know do Jeff that. I want to uh before uh, you make your point play once again the part of now Congressman Alex Swazi's a statement or his speech tonight where he talks about the message that he believes his victory is sending here to Washington. Let's send a message to our friends 
running the Congress these days. Stop running around for Trump and start running the country. So interesting. And what I'm wondering tonight, are 17 Republicans in particular listening to that? Mm -hmm. Who are they? The 17 Republicans in Biden districts. Mm -hmm. So that is something that is going to be so interesting and instructive. Many of whom are fellow New Yorkers. Yeah, yeah. for sure. E exactly. A lot of the House majority here is going to run through either New York or California and a handful of other states in the middle. But uh, up until now, Manu, as you know very well, uh, the, uh, you know, the shift in really in the last month or so, uh, even some of the uh, more moderate Republicans like Don Bacon of my home state of Nebraska uh, has been much more willing to go out there. He has a primary challenge. Others do as well. But that's what I wonder tonight. Will some of those Republicans be taking a lesson that and Trump may not be good for us in the long term? But I think something else instructive in the Biden campaign statement tonight, uh, they mentioned Donald Trump four times. They once again are trying to do one thing above all in this election, to make this entire election about Donald Trump. And he often helps them out with that case. But again, as so many people have said uh, this evening, uh, I think there are some lessons tonight, but they're limited as well because the general election is going to be much more fully engaged. But a test run that shows all is not lost for Democrats. And a lot of people in the last week, uh, there's been a lot of bedwetting. We say that a lot. Uh, this is calm that. Among now. Democrats? Yeah, I know. Shocker, I know. That's you know, so weird, but, you know uh, one thing the Republicans have been good at in this Congress is finger planning. And I can ex yeah. you tomorrow morning mm -hmm. when the House Republicans go behind closed doors and they have their weekly conference meeting, there is going to be a lot of finger pointing, not just about everything that went wrong or about the candidate or just about expelling George Santos. That was one of the one of the that's one of the reasons why a lot of members were upset about the initial Mayorkas impeachment falling. Uh, also ousting Kevin McCarthy. That led to his resignation. There are now another seat short because of that until that spe special election. So there is just going to be so much anger when Republicans come and meet tomorrow. And I think we talked about on the podcast with ousting McCarthy, there's been less fundraising for certain people. There's been less infrastructure support because the new speaker simply doesn't have any of that experience. That's not something you want going in. I think to test what you're talking about, Jeff, there, there are some theories that are tested, even if you can't take away full lessons. And one of them is, what are the limits of nationalizing a race around issues like immigration and crime, et cetera? Can you kind of trick yourself into thinking, well, this is a slam dunk? Uh, because here we are yet again at another special election race saying it really seemed like that Republican was going to do well and it's the Democrat who wins. And I think kind of processing that and thinking about what it means going forward is sort of worth it. it. It's such an important point because in order to uh, to replicate this in this kind of district, you have to have a Democrat willing to do what Tom Swazi did, which is stand up at the very first, you know, second of his victory speech saying, I'm not a member of the squad. I'm not a, you know, I'm worried about my party. And uh, and also, just more importantly, on the issues. Yeah. But tonight, there, a member of the squad was here, right? Right. And see herself, and she didn't exactly throw him under the bus for not saying, I'm one of you, or for not, uh, you know, leaning into some of those really progressive positions. So having that flexibility, as you guys talked about earlier, is meaningful. And primary challenges are going to happen, and primaries will happen, and that's a much more uncertain thing. In this case, these candidates were uh, selected by the party bosses, essentially, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. as it was in the old days. Yeah. Uh, the primaries often um, are out of the party's control. Yeah, I mean, the, the candidates really do matter. At the end of the day, Swazi right. has that established brand. People knew who he was. Mondaire Jones, for instance, he's running against Mike Lawler in that district that Lawler was on earlier tonight. He's a much different type of Democrat than Tom Swazi. Yes. That's something Lawler would take advantage of. Will that make a difference when the top of the ticket will have such a huge impact down ticket? That's another question. Okay, everybody, up next, how Republicans are reacting to this huge loss to Democrats in New York and what it means for the battles ahead on Capitol Hill and in the November election. Democrats winning big in New York tonight with Tom Suozzi's victory in the special congressional election as he easily defeated his Republican opponent in the race, Mozzie Pillip, picking up the seat that was previously held by the now expelled Republican Congressman George Santos. Republicans' very slim majority in the House now even slimmer tonight. Let's go to Capitol Hill, where CNN's Melanie Zanona is getting reaction to tonight's results. Obviously, Melanie, Speaker Johnson's office was watching this vote very closely. What are you hearing 
from Republicans overall about that already slim majority shrinking even more. Yeah, well, Caitlin, there is some predictable finger pointing inside the GOP tonight, with some Republicans turning their anger towards fellow Republicans who voted to expel George Santos as their already razor thin majority is now set to get even slimmer. One Republican lawmaker told me that the GOP lawmakers who led the charge to expel Santos owe Republicans everywhere an apology and $10 million. Another Republican, Troy Nels, told me a little bit ago we should have never brought the Santos vote to the floor. Mike Collins, a Georgia Republican, wrote on social media. So who still thinks Republicans helping Democrats kick out Santos was a good idea and Santos himself weighing in simply writing on social media minus one. Now I interviewed Steve Scalise, the House Majority Leader, a little bit earlier tonight and I asked him, is there going to be any regret inside the GOP if Democrats do end up flipping this seat tonight? He didn't go quite as far. He said it is what it is. And he also downplayed the national significance of a potential Republican loss in New York 3. But no doubt, Caitlin, this is going to have massive implications for the slim majority and the GOP's ability to govern. And so those frustrations and floor fights only likely to go louder in the coming days. Caitlin. Yeah, an immediate impact, Melanie Zanona. Thank you. And we are now hearing from the former president, Donald Trump, about tonight's results and what it means. CNN's Kristen Holmes is in Florida covering the Trump campaign. What are we hearing from Trump, Kristen? Well, just moments ago, Donald Trump posted on True Social, and I'm going to read it in real time because I'm just now seeing it. Uh, and he essentially attacks Mozzie Phillip for not endorsing him, not running on his name. He says, Republicans just don't learn, but maybe she was still a Democrat. I have an almost 99% endorsement success rate in the primaries and a very good number in the general elections as well. But I just watched this very foolish woman, Mozzie Melissa Phillip, Racy, running in a race where she didn't endorse me and tried to straddle the fence when she would have easily won if she understood anything about modern day politics in America. MAGA, which is most of the Republican Party, stayed home and it will always, unless it is treated with the respect that it deserves. I stayed out of the race. I want to be loved, in quotes. Give us a real candidate in the district for November. Swazi, I know him well, can be easily beaten. Uh, I'm not sure what that I want to be loved in quotes is, um, but clearly upset that Mazi Pillup did not endorse him or did not try to run on his name at all. I will remind you that his team does not want him getting involved in races that he can't win because they don't want him attached to those kind of races. However, obviously, Trump took this a little bit personally and is now lashing out. Kristen Holmes, thank you. And Scott Jennings, I mean, first, let's set some things straight, which is that she did say in this race that she would not endorse Trump if he was convicted, that she didn't believe, she said no one's above the law. She didn't believe that he would be qualified to represent Republicans if that was the case. She did recently say, finally, that she did vote for him in 2020. But is what he's saying here, which is that in a district that Joe Biden won by eight points, more MAGA is the answer? Well, there are some Republican officials who believe she should have said right out of the gate she voted for Trump. And he's not wrong. She was a Democrat. And so, you she know, he still is a Democrat. She had to wait until yeah. after the race to, to change her registration, I believe. So, he, you know, he, he may have a point on a couple of these issues. In a low turnout special election, did she leave votes on the field? I don't know. And would it be different in November? Maybe. There are some other people here. I mean, some folks are talking up this, uh, this fella, uh, Daniel Norber, who, you know, was also running against Santos before the special election started. So, I, and I don't know which way we're going to head here, but. Obviously, when you lose a race, people are going to look for reasons why you might have lost. And uh, I'm not surprised to there, see him picking it out. But there's not eight points more MAGA out there, not, not in this uh, district. Like, he's just a crybaby, man. It's just, dude, you are not the answer to everybody's question. It, you're just not. And it's, it's just sad to see him. You know, you can just imagine you're just there just working his little thumbs off, just so, so upset that you know, somebody lost and also didn't kiss his ring. A lot of people who kiss his ring do lose, and that's the problem. We got to figure out what the I want to be loved in quotes. Let's <laughs> <laughs> take, just take a moment. <laughs> and I, try to understand I feel like it has something about. to do with he's, he's saying that she didn't endorse him. Yeah. yeah. And she didn't tie herself enough to him because she wanted to be loved, is what it. That's well, my reading sure. of it as someone who covered him. I could be wrong, and I'm not going to read Donald <laughs> Trump's I mind. Think, I do think it gives us a little bit of insight into 
the political strategy of, of Trump world here for November. The, it, you talk to any Trump advisor, as you know, expanding the electorate to bring more new Trump MAGA line voters into the electorate, they think is their path to success far more than winning back over the a huge swaths of the middle that they lost uh, to Democrats in 2018, to Joe Biden yeah. in 2020. And I think you sort of see that here, too, that he thinks the path to political success mm -hmm. is just more modification of the electorate. Look, that is exactly right, that that is what they think. Leading up to 2020, that was the strategy. It did not work. The problem with this strategy from the... Trump world that comes, frankly, directly from Trump is that it doesn't work. We actually have data points that show in 2018 and 2020 and 2022, ramping up the MAGA backfired on Republicans in some key places where they could have won. In Arizona, for example, if they do it again, good luck. But it's just that the evidence is not there. And Republicans also have, like, a tactical problem here. The party's health, as from, like, an apparatus infrastructure standpoint, is, has bad signs over the last year. The reasons they are losing these special elections are getting candidates who are untested, unproven, are partly because Donald Trump has made it difficult for people to be able to come out of those primaries and, and specifically has placed his thumb on making it harder to have them have those type of messages that allow them to win those voters back. And so, you know, when we think about what's happening at the RNC with the tumult there and how Trump has made the kind of imprint on the party apparatus, even the ways that they haven't uh, embraced early voting on something like a snow day that comes back to bite them, right? Like you have Republican Party plowing roads today, you know? Th those are things that the party could do differently. And there's an open discussion within the party. But because Donald Trump's political imprint is so large, they not only have a messaging problem, a political problem, they have a party apparatus infrastructure problem, partially because it's been so pulled to his, his, his everyday win, you know? I mean, you two know this area better than anyone else at the table. I mean, when you hear him say that the reason the turnout wasn't what it, they expected it to be, he says it's because she wasn't MAGA enough. But, but is it because of Scott's point earlier that they don't, Republicans have not actively embraced early voting? Uh, there's probably a number of reasons why she lost. And as I say, we're going to downgrade. And, and for full disclosure, for somebody who was endorsed by Donald Trump, and um, he was gracious when he did it, and I was grateful for that endorsement, and I, and I won, um, I actually sort of understand the dynamic of she, they're going to tar, and they did tar this woman as a right-wing radical Republican anyway. Mm -hmm. So take what you got. And to Scott's point, in a, in a low turnout uh, race, you're going to motivate people who otherwise wouldn't come out to vote to come out. And to a member of Congress who spoke earlier in this program, they want to win. So if you want to win and you want to govern and are based on your policies, not to say you cross the line on things, but if he can help you win, why wouldn't you want that endorsement? And I've seen this over the years where people say, I don't want that because they're going to label me. They're going to label you anyway. Yeah. Just take it and run with it. Right. I also think that Democrats chose the right candidate. It was someone who was tested. He's known. Uh, he's been known in this district for over 30 years. He is someone who has been able to get crossover votes in races where he's needed them. And that was a good choice, you know. And he had the message sure. of unifying people. And I think, let's see if that is a message that can go until November. Jake, back to you. All right. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Let's go to CNN's Lauren Fox, who is at the headquarters of Republican Mozzie Pillip. Uh, in East Meadow, New York. Uh, Lauren, Republicans saw this race as a high-profile test for their ability to campaign on border security, to keep a seat that had been in Republican hands that did not work out tonight. W what are Republicans saying is the reason? Yeah, Republicans really thought that there wasn't going to be a better district to test drive that message on immigration than right here. That is because there's a migrant shelter that was built last summer on the edge of this district. The headlines that you hear here in New York, so pertinent to so many voters in this district who were worried about crime, who are worried about the influx of migrants to the New York area. In fact, I talked to one dad at a diner this morning who said he's scared to take his kids into the city because of what he's seeing on the news. Republicans were really seizing on that, trying to make this issue front and center. But Tom Swazi kind of flipped the script because he actually showed up at an event that Mozzie Pillip did where she was talking about immigration, waited for her to finish. And then 
had his own press conference, took reporter questions and argued that he had a solution and Mozzie Pillip was out there just campaigning against the issue. You know, I think Swazi's message here that he sees a bipartisan path forward, that he would have supported the Senate bill that really only survived about 48 hours in the United States Senate, still gave him an opening to neutralize that issue. And, you know, this issue, if it couldn't play in New York 3, it's really unclear where across the country it's going to be able to play as the predominant issue. I should note, every single voter I talked to said immigration was their top issue. It just turned out that they trusted Democrats more than Republicans, perhaps, to handle it. Yeah, with, with this specific set, uh, set of candidates, right? Because it's Swazi who is pushing uh, a willingness to compromise with Republicans, even a more moderate message on immigration than you hear uh, from a lot of Democrats. And then uh, Mazi Pillip, who is kind of saddled with uh, the inability of Republicans right now to, to govern in any real way. Uh, so anyway, uh, Lauren, thanks so much. Let's talk more about the issue set that, that uh, had an influence on the uh, race uh, with CNN political director David Chalian. David, um, immigration, border security, they did play majorly into tonight's race the way that Lauren said, right? There's no doubt about it. And look at the national landscape of the immigration issue, according to our most recent poll uh, from the end of January. So uh, President Biden's approval rating, Jake, as you know, on immigration, it's his worst tested issue across every issue. It's at 30 percent approval, 70 percent disapproval. We also asked folks, and again, this was a nationwide poll, whether or not the U.S. should prioritize deporting all undocumented immigrants versus uh, providing a pathway uh, to citizenship. In 2019, only 15% said the priority should be deporting all undocumented immigrants. That has doubled in 2024 now to 31%. And that's overall. When you look at it just among Republicans, Jake, 32% of Republicans said the priority should be deporting undocumented immigrants. That was in 2019. Now a majority of Republicans, 54%, say the priority for the U.S. should be deporting undocumented immigrants. And that is why you saw... You know, two thirds of the immigration uh, ad spending in this race coming from Mozzie Pillup, and why you saw at the very end Tom Swazi trying to engage on that and flip the script, as you were noting, to say he was part of the solution on this issue, uh, not just raising it as a problem. Interesting stuff. Dave Chalian, thanks so much. So, I, sure. there is a risk here, uh, Dana, that the Democrats think. Oh, you know, immigration is not going to be a liability for us. I don't think any smart Democrats would say that. Um, but, but the truth is, this is very specific to this set of circumstances, this, these two candidates. Swazi positioning himself as a, a moderate to conservative on the issue. And in an, in an era, in an environment where Democrats were trying to come up with a compromise, and Republicans are the ones uh, that shanked it. Totally anecdotally, I was in the district the day after uh, Republicans shanked it, to use your term. And I heard from voters that they were very, no, these are obviously um, very well-informed voters, right. but they were, they were at the polling station, they were voting early. And several of them said to me that they don't uh, want to vote for the Republican because it's clearly impossible to get a solution on the issue of immigration. They said border uh, the border problem, the immigration issue, uh, the migrant issue in their district was the top issue for them. And that the fact that Republicans killed that bipartisan deal uh, put them over the edge to vote for Tom Swazi. And immigration was their top issue. So I think that there's something to that. Uh, but I do want to underscore the main point that you made, which is that if you have a Democrat who just fundamentally doesn't believe in being as tough as Tom Swazi is on the migrant issue, then it's not going to work politically. Yeah, and I think let's not forget also how the Republicans even handled this bipartisan border deal. I mean, they were quick to dismiss it even before the deal was even reached. I mean, Donald Trump tried to kill this before there was actually anything to look at. And same with the Republican leadership. I mean, Lee Stefanik was out almost immediately saying that this bill, the deal that was reached after nearly five months of negotiations, said that it should be killed. The Speaker of the House, a couple of hours after it was released. These are incredibly complex policy issues to immediately dismiss it out of hand. 
perhaps looks to some voters who are following this pretty closely as clearly politically expedient without actually trying to solve a real problem. Look, there have been... Oh, I was just going to add that the argument Swazi made fundamentally, it's like they're the dog that caught the car. It was like, Mm -hmm. do this thing and then blow it up. And I think he was able to talk about that in a way that voters could understand that didn't feel like kind of parliamentary nonsense. It felt like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. It was their idea. Why don't they want it? And maybe that's something other Democrats can take away. I mean, there have been bright warning signs. Adi, as you said earlier, uh, we have so many elections now to look at. 2018, 2020, 2022, the suburbs have been bright red warning signs for Republicans uh, in the era of Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. even before then in some degree. So one thing that kind of went a bit under the the radar um, in some respects was the the message on abortion here. But I think the I was just talking to a Democratic strategist who said this is our playbook right now. It's not going to work everywhere, but they can neutralize the sort of challenge on immigration by going after abortion rights. But the uh, Trump problem, perhaps, is the biggest takeaway from this. I mean, he was focusing on the candidate calling her a foolish person, never mind any introspection, which, of course, he doesn't do. Mm -hmm. But there are big warning signs for Republicans in these suburban districts, which uh, the party needs. I do think, though, we should note that I could see this issue, immigration and the refusal of Republicans to compromise, being used to an advantage by a Democrat like, say, for instance, uh, Bob Casey in Pennsylvania, more center left. I, I don't know that Joe Biden, who you saw has a disastrous approval rating on this issue, only 30 percent approval, 70 percent disapproval, specifically on the border and immigration. I don't know that President Biden himself is going to be able to pivot on this, even though he's obviously trying. You heard the statement, from, <clears throat> the statement that MJ Lee read from the White House where they're trying to talk about how the Republicans are refusing to embrace border security and immigration reform. That would be a neat trick if he could turn it around. But I don't know, while I do think that it's possible that Democrats running for re-election this year in the House and Senate will be able to (coughs) maybe make that argument, I don't know that somebody that people blame the border problem for We'll be able to do that. I don't know what you think, Audie. I mean, I, mean, I, I want to add a point, a, kind of a footnote, which is that as soon as Swazi opened his mouth, there was a protester who was there to con- to criticize this administration's handling of the war in Gaza and specifically the numbers of deaths of civilians and Palestinians. This is going to be a problem if every time there's a Democratic victory, there's that moment where the cameras have to be like, wait, who is that? What are they saying? Well, guess what they're saying? They're using the phrase genocide Joe. This is one of those things where I think the administration hasn't quite found a way to talk about it, um, but I don't think it's going away. And I just wanted to raise that, even though in this race it didn't put the candidate over. Pillip didn't somehow, right. you know, win the whole thing because of that. But it's just a thing that it's like it's going to go from being a footnote in every article to being the issue. And it will yeah. play out in Michigan. The next primary on the calendar after South Carolina is the Michigan primary yeah. on February 27th, uh, Republican and Democratic. It's already a huge concern for the White House, for the Biden campaign. Uh, what's going to happen right after that? He'll be giving his State of the Union address on March 7th. Uh, the White House is already worried about a protest there, <laughs> but uh, at least he'll have one more uh, Democratic member um, in front of him in the House, but uh, it's still an issue. Coming up next, the big takeaways from this special election and what the results tell us about the year ahead with the White House and control of Congress on the line. We'll be right back after this. Democrats have just picked up another seat in the House of Representatives, handing a serious blow to Republicans and their already slim grip on power. We're breaking down the results from tonight's special election in New York with Democrat Tom Suozzi's big win and what it could all mean for the presidential race. Let's go back to John King. John, uh, obviously, we're just hearing from the White House that President Biden has called Tom Suozzi. Now, the question is, without extrapolating too much, how are they reading into these results? I think you make the key point. How do you try to find lessons without overstating the importance of one special election? Let's just go back and look very quickly at the results, though. What you have here is a Democrat in what was viewed as a very close race, Caitlin, though, uh, with an eight-point lead at the moment, and most of the votes counted. So that's an impressive win for the Democrat. 
Democrat Tom Suozzi. The conversation now in both Democratic and Republican campaigns, including the Trump and the Biden campaign, is was it just about him or was there something in the message? Was there a key ad that swung the race? What was it? That's what they're going to try to figure out and why. We don't expect New York, of course, to be competitive in the presidential election. But if you want to beam out, uh, number one, uh, if you're the Biden campaign uh, and you're the Democratic Party, uh, you want to win congressional elections, right? So you want to get the House back. Uh, there were 18 districts that Biden won that were held by Republicans. Now there will be 17 once Tom Suozzi is sworn in. So the first thing you look at is, can we get these House districts back, right? Is there something that happened here, the makeup of the district, the fact that Donald Trump is back in the news. Some Democrats think that, Caitlin, tonight, uh, that Donald Trump is back in the news of late, and maybe that's helping them there. So that's the House. So now let's come to the presidential race and look at 2020, and you think, did what happened in Queens and Nassau County, does it have anything to do with this, if we get, as we expect, the Joe Biden-Donald Trump rematch? Here's one way to look at it, if you want to look at it this way. These races, as you know very well, Caitlin, the close battleground states are decided where? In the suburbs. Where is Tom Suozzi's district? In the suburbs. And so you can look here, uh, you can look at the Pennsylvania suburbs, for example, a very close state just tonight. This is Bucks County. This is the 2020 presidential election. But just tonight, the Democrats also won a special election here for a state legislative seat that was hotly contested. So the Biden campaign celebrating that, saying, look, yes, the president's approval ratings are down. His views, as David Challen just said, his numbers on immigration are terrible. His numbers on the economy are not great. But... What the Democrats are arguing is when we have elections, when we actually have people vote, uh, we're doing okay, especially in the places that matter. So what they will do is they will look at this map and they will say, if what happened in Nassau County tonight, is there anything we can at least study now that we're in, you know, early in the year, as we get later in the year, uh, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, Georgia, the key battleground states, Caitlin, are won or lost in the suburbs. So tonight's win for the Democrats in the suburbs, it's going to, trust me, it's going to be the onion peeled by both the Trump and the Biden campaigns. Absolutely. John King, thank you. And Van Jones, as you look at this, and the White House is looking at this, I mean, it's a bit reassuring, sure. it, or it is reassuring to them that a Democrat can win in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. uh, but let me ask you the same question in the sense of, you know, not taking too much from one single special mm -hmm. election. What does the White House take from tonight? Well, look, I mean, it shows that Democrats can be uh, tough on the border credibly, and you can't, you can't, you don't have to just leave that for the Republicans to beat the crap out of us on that, especially since Republicans now refuse to do anything about it. So that's a good thing. But we still have the same problems uh, this week we had last week, which is that um, Biden still has not been able to deal with the age issue appropriately yet. And I've been thinking about it a lot. I think he just needs to own into it, uh, own it and lean into it. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, he made it a part of his shtick. He would say stuff like, you know, Thomas Jefferson said so-and-so. And when I was there, I mean, let the crowd laugh, and then he would move on. I think, there, I, think, I, think there's, I think Joe Biden should say, I'm for grandpa economics. I think he should just own it and say, you know what, you know what your grandpa wants? He wants you to get a good job. That's why unemployment is low. You know what your grandpa wants? He wants you to save your money and have a good 401k. That's why the stock market is up. You know what your grandpa wants? He wants you to drive safely. That's why gas prices are down. He should just say, I'm a grandpa, and I am doing things that grandpas care about because other people want to be in court all the time with, with felony convictions and, and lying about the border. I'm your grandpa. I'm taking care of you. If he would just own it, you could then, then he's like Eminem in 8 Mile. He made the rap joke about himself, and his opponents had nothing else to say. That's what Biden should do. Grandpa economics. I mean, I think the White House has tried versions of that, mm -hmm. uh, having Biden joke around about his age and, and all of that. And that works fine in that moment. But the problem is when he's out and about and does something or makes a mistake in a very public way, like he did during his speech last week when he called the president of Egypt the president mm -hmm. of Mexico, things like that undermine sure. the case that, it, that it's innocuous. And this is the challenge. I mean, look, th this is the challenge. The White House is very clear-eyed about it. What they're really hoping is that what happened tonight uh, is essentially what happens in November, which is that voters go into the voting booth and they say, not thrilled about X, Y, and Z, but here are my choices, this guy or that guy. <laughs> and they choose the person who is the least objectionable sure. to them. And the, that the, is the, what elections but, are all about. But you have the demented grandpa 
and the good grandpa. Well, a step <laughs> right, then, right? And that's and you just, that's, you, just you, you neutralize the issue by saying you got a demented grandpa. I'm, just, mm. I'm saying the grandpa economics think it work. Well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and take it to the bank. Okay. Okay. Okay, oh, what has to do with that one? No, he's not Eminem. He's, he's Werther's original. That's what he is. <laughs> I disagree. And, and, <laughs> and, and the age issue is going to matter. Lean into it, lean away from it. 86% of Americans don't think he can serve another term. And look at this guy tonight. Ran away from Joe Biden. Uh, Ran and, away and he didn't get from punished. Joe Biden. He didn't get punished. He didn't get jumped on by the candidate because we let people in our party have their own opinion, unlike people in it, your party who got to be in a cult. It's easy to run away in a special election. It's a lot harder to do in all these districts, all over, especially in swing states, when that presidential campaign is sitting well, right on top of it. Instead, Herndon, I mean, you talk to voters for a living and for the <laughs> Run Up podcast. This is truly what you do every single day. So I wonder, I mean, what are you hearing from voters themselves not just the poll numbers that we're looking at on this issue. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I feel like the last couple of weeks with the kind of rise in prominence of age and the focus on Biden has really brought the campaign to where voters and our conversations have been for a year, right? When we have been telling people that it's likely for Biden to be the Democratic nominee, people have been shocked. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did not fathom the possibility that this is the type of candidate that will be back. They saw themselves as kind of doing an emergency option in 2020. And that, for us, is the main feeling we got over the last year. Yes, they're shocked about Donald Trump, particularly with the indictments and the kind of reality of him as a kind of character. But that shock was shared with Biden. So I think the White House and the campaign are now dealing with that reality and has kind of brought the, the race to where it was always going to be. They not only have a message question. And I think this race kind of speaks to the ways that they can fix that. They can focus on things outside of the candidate. They can talk about abortion rights. They can talk about the kind of contrast between them and the chaotic party. They can focus on governance. But they, when they, specifically when we think about the top of the ticket, they have a messenger problem. They have the fact that the person who is filtering through that, who is, who is leading the party on that, and so voters fundamentally don't think can, should and can serve another four years. Now, they can give voters other reasons to still back him, but they're, that is going to be having to overcome their all, already kind of fundamental feeling, which is that they didn't expect this guy to be back. <laughs> and they're going to have to give the voters some other messengers as well. Yes. I mean, it's going to have to be other people carrying the, the burden, a lot of, of the, a lot of this campaign on the Democratic side, the Kamala Harris's. Uh, you know, lots of other folks who are trying to be the, the next in line the next time this comes around for the Democrats. Well, messengers do matter. And look, tonight was a big victory for Democrats. They picked the right candidate who had the right message and had the money behind him. Now, we all know that the road to Democrats taking back the House runs directly through New York. So let's see if they can get the right candidates. You know, the Republicans are going to be regrouping tomorrow. Mm -hmm to decide whether they're going to keep the same candidate or find someone better, we need to look at all of those seats that we lost two years ago and do our best to get the best messenger with the best financial backing, um, the best candidate, so that we can take, you know, take the House back. That is cr of critical importance as well. Yeah. Hakeem Jeffries watching that very closely. Yeah. More news on CNN after that big win for Democrats after a quick break.